Okay, it is 10 o'clock. I'd like to ask you to take your seats. My name is Brenda Himrick, and I am one of the co-chairs with Sarah Johnson of the local chapters, Halsey Hall Chapters Research Committee. And we will be co-MCs today as well. So, um, and by the way, we're also co-bosses at Major League Baseball. And what that means, boss is a balls out and strike spotter. And so we enter data as quickly as we possibly can to keep a live stream of good quality data going out to who's ever buying this data from Major League Baseball. So that's why we're the boss. <laughs> so um, I, I think that that's a great thing. We, we're a good team and we, we are collaborative leaders and I think that that fits with Sabre so much as you will see that many of us are, and many of our research projects are collaborative efforts. So here we have some great minds that are coming together to talk about 19th century baseball and other related projects. And I'm very excited and, and I want to make sure that you all feel really, really welcome here. I have some announcements to make. In a former life, I was a safety person, so I have to re tell you that the fire exits in case of an e emergency evacuation are in the back of the room where you came in and there's another one on the side over there. Also, good information to know, around that corner, there's an outlet that's really good if your phone needs to be recharged. And so while we're talking about cell phones or iPads or anything that can go beep or click and make obnoxious noises that might be distracting to your neighbors, I see people reaching into their pockets looking for their cell phones, please put them on vibrate and if you need to take a call, step out into the hallway in the back and take care of business. So um, just asking you to do that. All right, we have displays that you are going to be able to see during, we have two breaks planned, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, and then lunchtime. There's gonna be times to look at the displays that are downstairs that were prepared by the Minnesota with information from the Minnesota Historical Society. And then also, I say I'm getting nods from some people, I love it. And also uh, from the library staff here. So we, we really would not be able to make this happen if we weren't collaborating with the uh, Hennepin County Library, of which this central library is, is like the gemstone. People at Southdale might argue, but anyway, I think this is way better. <laughs> and um, also, those are the two, those are our collaborative groups. That, that really helped us out with that. Okay, when I wanna take a moment to, and this relates to one of our displays, which is our, our banner that our research committee put together, and you may have seen that out in the entry area, a big banner, spread of baseball in Minnesota, that shows the first documented baseball game in each county in um, the state of Minnesota. Now, we're a little short, we're missing about 30 counties, so it's an ongoing research project. So there are opportunities for people to continue with their research on that. And <laughs> at the bottom of that, you will notice that there's a, a map that shows the treaties and that were broken with the Native Americans and how the territories shrunk for the Native Americans that were here before. So I, while we're thinking about baseball and how it spread and across Minnesota, and while we're thinking about what happened in the 19th century in Minnesota and the Midwest, we need to remember those that were here before us. And those were the Dakotas and the Ojibwe and the Lakota. And I know there's other tribes that I'm not mentioning, but those are the ones that many of us are most familiar with. So just wanna think about them. And also while our thoughts are going out too, you may notice that there is in your programs, Brian Madigan is listed in there under the people who were going to be, his bio is in there.
but he's not listed in the program. He can't be with us today because his mother passed away, so he's out in South Dakota with his family. So um, we're very sad that he couldn't be here because, man, he works so hard with the library. He was, he was one of our main contacts, and, and um, we're very sad that he cannot be here with him and are thinking of him and his family. All right. Is there anything else? I, anything I'm missing, Sarah? That's what we back each other up. So now I want us to give a quick warm welcome to Bob Bailey, who's going to give us further welcoming comments before we start with our presentations. So Bob, can you come on up here? Oh, okay. You. <laughs> There's stairs over here. Good morning. Uh, I'm Bob Bailey, for those of you who know me. I'm Bob Bailey for those of you who don't know me. Uh, and I'm the vice chair of Sabre's 19th Century Committee. I'm also the newsletter uh, editor, and as I uh, am in these situations, I always uh, am permanently seeking someone to take my place as the newsletter editor and looking for a volunteer that will happily assume that responsibility, although the happily part is optional. Uh, uh, but this gathering is, is sponsored uh, by the, the Hennepin County uh, Public Library, the Sabres Halsey Hall chapter, and the 19th Century uh, uh, Committee of Sabre. Uh, it's the fourth in a series of uh, city-specific symposia and conferences that we've held over the last five, six years. And they deal with 19th century baseball in that uh, uh, locality. It goes along with our, uh, the 12 years we've been running the uh, Frederick Ivor Campbell Conference in Cooperstown, where we look at uh, 19th century baseball in, in all of its uh, totality. But we've been in uh, uh, Manhattan, Philadelphia, Cleveland, and now uh, Minneapolis. And if, you, if my geography is right and the vector of where we're moving, the, the next meeting will be in Regina, Saskatchewan. <laughs> uh, this series started uh, five, six years ago, or at least the idea, the germination of it, uh, with conversations uh, between the, uh, the chairman of the committee, Peter Mancuso, and John Thorne, who you'll hear from later. In, in great detail, and many of you will still be awake at the end of it, so it'll be a very nice conversation. But they were talking about trying to expand, or, or the meeting in Cooperstown is fairly well established, how could we move around a little bit, and that's what we uh, uh, have here. Uh, as it, it, we partner with uh, uh, the local chapters, and they've been uh, very helpful, and certainly the, the Halsey Hall chapter here has, has done a, a wonderful job getting the venue and, and putting the program together. Now, Peter it, it comes to all of these, these things. However, he had uh, some minor surgery recently and uh, some other health issues and uh, sends his regard and, and uh, best wishes. But an awful lot of the oversight and coordination of these things comes from, from Peter, and I like to acknowledge that. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, uh, very nice uh, uh, turnout for these things. It's, uh, the, uh, we, we get in the 50 to 70 uh, at the various uh, uh, meetings. And although I'm f from Florida and I consider you know, the depth of winter to be somewhere around 55 degrees, uh, uh, this apparently is what the locals call a brief cold spell. Uh, here, uh, but thank you for the welcome and thank you for coming today. Good morning. 
So we just wanted to make a brief note that after all of the presentations, we'll have a Q&A. So we have some microphones, handheld microphones down there. So me and Brenda will be um, going around. So if you have a question, you can just raise your hand and we will find you. So, and, uh, so I am pleased to introduce John Thorne. He is the official historian for Major League Baseball and he is a recipient of Sabres Bob David's Award and the Chadwick Award. And in addition to being the author of Baseball in the Garden, of Eden, he is also the author and editor of numerous other baseball and sports books and reference works. He is the co-founder and original co-chair of Sabres 19th Century Committee, and he will present the welcome address titled, Rival to Savior, the Western League Saves the National League from Suicide. So please help me in welcoming John Thorne. I wanted to follow Bob's leap up the stage, but I thought this could be fatal. <laughs> I also liked Bob's reference to our wish to expand the Fred Ivor Campbell Conference to uh, other locations. And I've spoken at each of the four, so I feel like I, I ought to have some honorary badge as a, as a permanent member of the medicine show. Uh, and, and whether we do Saskatchewan next year or some more western place remains to be seen, but I'm delighted to be here and delighted to be in what you will see is the West. Thanks to all in attendance and to those who did the hard work of organizing the conference. The fourth such sponsor by Sabre's 19th Century Research Committee is my mic working fine for everybody. Thanks to the Minneapolis Public Library for hosting us and to the Halsey Hall chapter for sponsoring the event too. And thank you to God and baseball for giving us another season, even if the twins raised hopes only to dash them. And thanks to all in the audience, most of you from Minnesota, who will indulge me a bit as I bring coals to Newcastle or rather walleye and muskie to the land of lakes. I was asked some months ago for purposes of advanced promotion of this event to supply a title for my as yet unwritten, unwritten speech. What I offered was, and it's in your programs, Road to Savior, Rival to Savior, the Western League Saves the National League from Suicide. And, and that's a great title because it has kind of a Frank Merriwell Dick Daring uh, tie, uh, heroin tied to the... Uh, um, rail uh, bed uh, feel. The transformation from rival to savior describes pretty well how baseball has greeted all harbingers of change. Here referencing the Kubler-Ross stages of grief. From the rise of professionalism to the dawn of the National League, subsequent rivals, the designated hitter, defensive shifts, you name it. The stages are, for those of you who are not steeped in this already, Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Change in baseball, as it turns out, is good. I caution that what follows is, is as advertised, a welcoming speech based upon little to no original research. Fortunately, excellent speakers with fascinating topics and dazzling data follow me. As I began to think about today's talk, it developed that this rival to savior title was the cart, not the horse, and more properly formed a conclusion to the presentation, which might more aptly be titled with apologies to Puccini, the game of the Golden West. And that is the title that I will use when I publish this text at our game next week. What is the West? anyway, a direction or a destination or an idea. It is all of those things, though I'll confine myself for now to what the West has meant to Americans, especially those in other regions of our land. 
when Shakespeare has Olivia say in Twelfth Night or what you will, there lies your way due west. And Viola responds, then westward ho. He, she, was echoing the 16th century boatman's call along the Thames, London's great highway of traffic. When Horace Greeley said, or did not say, scholars argue, go west, young man, he supplied the watchword of manifest destiny, the doctrine of America's prophetic role among the world's nations in which its ideals and territory would o'erspan the continent. Long ere the second centennial arrives, Walt Whitman declared in 1876, there will be some 40 to 50 great states, among them Canada and Cuba. This prediction was indeed borne out, not in the USA's constituent parts, but in its professional baseball leagues. To go west, following the sun toward milk and honey and riches, was to return to an unspoiled Eden, fulfilling the destiny of the individual and the nation. My friend Larry McRae, who shows up at the Fred Ivor Campbell Conference each year, once wrote to me, when the boy James Madison awoke in Orange, Virginia, he looked out at America's western border. Just imagine if Jefferson had stayed true to his principles and hadn't pressed to pick up the Mississippi at the one moment that the French felt like selling. I replied, and I'm quoting an email exchange of 15 years ago. Sure, the Louisiana Purchase was big, but the Erie Canal, America's great highway, not only opened the West and enlarged New York City's profile, but it also helped to alienate further those below the Mason-Dixon who may have sensed that their slave-based agrarian economy would one day be left behind. I think the completion of Clinton's 360-mile ditch in 1825, when the longest canal in our new nation was 20 miles long, is the single most influential event in American history in the 19th century, excepting only the Civil War. Larry and I were both right. Had it not been for westward expansion and the economic linking of the West with New York City by way of Lake Erie, well, Baltimore and New Orleans would have continued their march toward becoming America's two great cities. And to get back to the subject that has drawn you here today, the kind of baseball we might have played in those years before the Civil War might have resembled the bat and ball variants played in the South, not the rival games of the 1840s, those of Philadelphia, Massachusetts, or New York, with New York emerging victorious. But I get ahead of myself. What did we mean when we spoke of the West? In colonial times, Connecticut owned the charter to a Western reserve that included all lands south of its Massachusetts border and west of the then-defined New York borders as its sovereign territory. The Susquehanna settlements were in dispute with Pennsylvania from early on. So both Ohio and Michigan were fair game for Connecticut to claim as its soil. Certain regions of Ohio were termed New Connecticut. In the early years of nationhood, the nutmeggers sold lots and whole townships for revenue. While Philadelphia, New York, New England, and Baltimore played their distinctive regional variants of baseball, in Connecticut, an odd game called wicket or wicket ball reigned. It resembled what Britons thought of as country cricket, a game that by the 1750s had been utterly supplanted in England by the standardized modern game, Mary LeBone Rules, 1744. But you knew that. Wicket had gone wherever Connecticut emigrants settled, to the Western Reserve of Ohio and Michigan, or with the congregational missionaries to Hawaii. Yes, it seems Wicket was played on Oahu in the 1830s, long before Alex Cartwright brought in baseball, if he did. 
So if pioneers went as far west as Hawaii and California in the 1830s and 1840s, skipping through and over the prairie and mountain terrains, why were Minnesota and Iowa and the Dakotas also termed the West? Because up until the Civil War, it was the winding course of the Mississippi River that governed. H.W. Brands wrote about the 1860 election in his recently published Dreams of El Dorado, A History of the American West, and I quote, the election was divisive, but the outcome foreordained. Lincoln didn't have to win a single electoral vote in the South in order to carry the election. He didn't, and he did. Even before his inauguration, Southern states began to secede. First South Carolina, then six more. The last two of the seven, Louisiana and Texas, were crucial. Has secession been limited to states east of the Mississippi, many Northerners, conceivably including Lincoln, might have attempted, might have been tempted to let them go. They would never be more than a rump country on the wrong side of history, weighed down by slavery while the rest of the civilized world, under the double inspiration of democracy and industrialization, was abandoning the feudal institution. But when secession leaped the Mississippi, Lincoln refused to let the Confederacy endanger the West and jeopardize America's future. Minnesota was admitted as the 32nd state on May 11, 1858, created from the eastern half of the Minnesota Territory. In December of that year, the first baseball club was organized, the Olympics of St. Paul. Professionalism emerged slowly, possibly drawing inspiration from the coup d'etat of the Western ball clubs of the National Association in the winter of 1875-76. A meeting in Louisville on December 17, 1875, which went largely unreported because Chadwick declined to attend, sealed the deal. Albert Spaulding, who had deserted Boston for Chicago, observed with tongue firmly thrust into cheek. It was especially desirable to keep out all gamblers and jockeys if possible, and unless we do this, I have not much hope for a healthy revival of the good old-fashioned honest baseball. On some of the grounds, especially in Philadelphia and New York, pools are sold on the ground, and a baseball match is an occasion for all sorts of evil practices. It is to be hoped the West will set the East as an example this year. It would set quite an example as on February 2nd, 1876, in a meeting at the Grand Central Hotel in New York, the Western faction of owners would leave the National Association of Professional Baseball Players and create a new National League of Professional Baseball Clubs. The old circuit, a mixture of cooperative or gate sharing clubs on the one hand and fully salaried stock companies on the other, would give way to a league in which capital presided over labor and thus created today's Major League Baseball, which has in turn supplied the basic model for all professional sports worldwide. Amateur baseball in Minnesota flourished after the Civil War, highlighted by an 1867 call for a baseball players convention to create a state organization. Professionalism surely crept in during the 1870s, but the state's first avowedly professional clubs took form in 1884, the second year of the Northwestern League. The Northwestern League is an appellation that had previously struck me as ridiculous because it was neither very far north nor very far west. In fact, in 1883, if I'm recalling correctly, the member clubs included clubs in Saginaw and Quincy, Illinois, and Fort Wayne, Indiana. What kind of Northwestern club is that? <laughs> the St. Paul Club finished 1884 as a late, a late entrant into the ill-fated Union Association and thus marked the state's first big league club. A new Western League organized for 1885 and broke up a few years later. 
Minnesota placed St. Paul and Minneapolis clubs in the Western Association of 1889 and then in the reorganized Western League of the mid-1890s. Meanwhile, the National League had managed to kill the Players League after its lone 1890 season. And then the American Association, its decade-long rival, in the year after that, absorbing four of its clubs to become an unwieldy 12-team circuit. In the process, it also obviated the need for a postseason World Series, which had captivated fans since 1884. Eleven clubs would play all season long to determine a champion, and more than half of them would be out of the running by Memorial Day. Even the advent of the Temple Cup Series for the years 1894 through 97, pitting the pennant winner against the second place finisher, failed to spark fan interest. Like the dog chasing the car that, having caught it, wonders what to do with it, the National League owners had created their monopoly. To secure it, they would have to experiment as challenges arose from bicycling and collegiate football. The death of baseball proclaimed on a daily basis today was equally in, uh, in the sights of writers in the 1890s. Tammany Hall big shot Andrew Friedman, owner of the Giants, proclaimed that the pursuit of baseball's business should be a matter for the league, not for 12 franchises, each with a different local challenge. He suggested the annual pooling and redistribution of players and profits provided that the strongest and most lucrative franchises got the best players. This was syndicate baseball in which a single ownership might control two clubs, as with Cleveland and St. Louis, and Baltimore and Brooklyn. Had the other owners gone along fully with Friedman's plan, this would have been a baseball trust akin to all the others that Teddy Roosevelt would one day bust up. Business corruption. Remember the Cleveland Spiders and their 1899 mark of 20 wins against 134 losses makes the 1962 Mets look pretty good. <laughs> Business corruption was compounded by rowdyism and vile on-field language. Attendance by ladies became as uncommon as at a cockfight or boxing match. When top teams like the Baltimore Orioles and the Cleveland Spiders augmented their play with roughhouse tactics like spiking and jostling runners, beating umpires, and bench jockeying, this rough brand of ball stirred the ire of reformers, like Cincinnati owner John T. Brush and his pal, Porcupolitan sports writer and, for 1894, new president of the Western League. Johnson and Brush would come to dominate the game in the first decade of the next century. They would combine with another Western lad, Charles Comiskey, who had captained the St. Louis Browns to four straight flags in the old association and now was managing and playing out the string with Cincinnati. After the 1894 season, Kami bought the Sioux City team in the Western League and transferred it to St. Paul. The straight-laced Johnson thought that what baseball needed to draw fans was not the constant threat of impending violence and language unsuitable for delicate ears, but instead the rule of law and the practice of decorum. By backing his umpires, he set an alternative path from the one the National League was spiraling down. In 1900, Johnson's model for the Western League would produce, when he renamed it the American League, a new rival that, contract, that the contracted National League, now reduced from 12 teams to eight, did its best to kill, but could not. Amid all the intramural bloodletting of the National League of 1899, Johnson saw his opening for a purifying coup d'etat of the sort that had created the National League in the first place. Renaming his Western League as the American League, a not altogether symbolic shift as it signified his intent. Johnson encouraged Comiskey to move the St. Paul franchise into Chicago to challenge Spalding directly. 
The National League's great consolidation from 12 clubs to eight had left four cities for the taking and many major league players suddenly unemployed. In 1900, Johnson renamed his Western League with designs on East Coast cities. Foremost among these was New York, where the Giants had fallen, under, fallen on hard times under Friedman's enigmatic ownership. But political factors delayed Johnson's entrance there until 1903. Johnson's American League was content to operate as a minor circuit in 1900, but in the fall of that year, he made a peace overture to the NL, asking for parity as a major league. We got a guy here with a pitch clock. This is really offensive. <laughs> and I am going to ignore the pitch clock, just as Zach Greinke did in, uh, game, in game three. <laughs> Resuming, his American League was content to operate as a minor circuit in 1900, but in the fall of that year, Johnson made a peace overture to the NL, asking for parity as a major league with access to certain lucrative territories while foregoing certain others and assuring respect for National League player contracts. As Johnson expected, however, the proffered olive branch was rebuffed. National League President Nick Young wished success to Johnson's new venture, but said he considered it an outlaw league, not a major league. So Johnson went to war, abrogating the national agreement, thus opening the door to raids on NL player contracts. He also placed franchises in current National League cities, Philadelphia and Boston, as well as 1899 National League sites, Washington and Baltimore. These complemented his strong Western franchises in Chicago, Cleveland, Detroit, and Milwaukee. Big league attendance in 1900, when the eight-team National League was the only game in town, was 1.8 million. Three years later, with two eight-team major leagues, it was 4.7 million. The upward trend line for the game's popularity was evident. And the West, the Edenic frontier, had again saved the game from the clutches of the East. Questions? <laughs> yes, sir. There was an economic depression in the 1890s. Notably 1893, sure. Notably, 1893, how sure. Big, yeah. There was a depression in the 18. How big a factor was that in all of this? Well, it, it was a big factor for the National League, just as the economic depression of the mid-1870s had been for the National League then. In the 1870s, the National League, uh, the only teams that ever made money were Chicago and Boston. And um, in the 1890s, the teams that made money were, again, Chicago and Boston, New York was not making money. So out of the 12 teams in the National League in the mid-1890s, Baltimore had a sudden rush of, rush of prosperity because of the quality of its club. But baseball um, was perceived to be in decline as discretionary income for spectator sports declined. I thank you. Yes, sir. Absolutely, yes, and, and Spalding's manufacturing um, tilted toward bicycling and bicyclists more so than to baseball. Uh, the yes, yes, uh, velodromes. Uh, six-day races, that kind of thing. Sure, it was a big spectator sport. Thank you very much. Uh, another question, uh, John. Yes, Bob. Um, there wasn't any uh, t um, commandment that came down from anywhere uh, dictating that baseball had to become professional in the uh, 18 in its course of its development. Um, what do you uh, attribute? the rise of professional baseball too? The rise of professional baseball in Minnesota and the West in the 1870s followed the path of the rise of professionalism in the East in the 1850s. 
that as clubs decided that getting together for social purposes was less significant, a less significant aim for them than actually winning the ball game, uh, they might welcome players of a different social class and that cast of players might need to have financial inducements or support, deadhead jobs for the dads, um, under the table payments to the players, the uh, rise of professionalism everywhere, the story is always the same. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much to Oh, we're gonna take a, is this on? We're gonna take a short break now and be back in here please at 11 a.m. for our next presentation. Okay, can we take our seats, please? Welcome back. I hope you all had a chance to look at the spread of baseball banner and also went downstairs to look at the case that has some great items that were put together by the library staff and photos from the Minnesota Historical Society. So I hope you had a chance to look at those. Um, I want to just make a couple of comments about my co mc and I, Sarah Johnson and I. In addition to being bosses, which stands for balls out and strike spotters, we are also field timing coordinators for Major League Baseball at the Twins game. So when there is going to be, when the pitch clock comes, it's not if, it's more like when the pitch clock comes, we're going to be operating the pitch clock. And I just want you to know that I take timing very seriously. <laughs> and and I, with, with apologies, um, because it, it can be rather startling if suddenly, if you're not used to flashcards that are showing up, up in the front here telling you when your time is up, they're there to help you keep on time and so that we still have enough time for all the Q&A afterwards. We wanna make sure that people have a chance to, to ask their, their questions at the end of each. And we have five minutes set aside for that after each presentation. But I take timing so seriously that when Joe Maurer was playing his last game here and he was doing the tipping his cap to the audience and everybody is, they're, they're not letting him get in the batter's box well, my job is to time them. And if they don't get in the batter's box in time, I write them up. <laughs> and I wrote up Joe Maurer. <laughs> so I just want you to know that. Our next presenter, though, is Dan Levitt. He is a longtime chapter, Halsey Hall chapter and Sabre member. He is the recipient of the Bob Davids Award. And that award, Bob Davids was a founding member of the Society for American Baseball Research, and it is the highest honor that can be received by someone in Sabre. So he is a recipient of that award, along with several other awards, the Chadwick Award. His books have won the Larry Ritter Book Award and the Sporting News Sabre Baseball Research, Research Award. So he has won a lot of awards. <laughs> Are you turning red, Dan? A little bit he is, I can tell. Uh, <laughs> he is also the author of several essays and books, including Pursuits of Penance, The Battle That Forged Modern Baseball, and Ed Barrow, The Bulldog Who Built the Yankees' First Dynasty. Go Yankees. So I would like to present <laughs> Dan Levitt on Economics of Minor League Baseball, 1876 to 1900. And he took the shortcut too. Dan. Thank you. When I was uh, talking to Bob Focus about a topic, you know, he we were we were batting various things around, and he suggested I use my interest in the business of baseball and talk about minor league economics. And I got to tell you, I was a little bit leery when 
my topic is anything regarding minor leagues, but it's really a fascinating topic. There was a lot going on as these regional leagues were trying to create an opportunity for themselves in a really wide open and ever-changing environment at the end of the 19th century. Um, let's give a little bit of context here first. The National League, as you guys all know, was formed in 1876, and they really incorporated four tenets that we now take for granted when we try and figure out what a league is. First of all, control over its membership, exec exclusive territorial rights, a common schedule, and then player contracts that were registered at the league office so players couldn't jump from team to team in the middle of a season or a week. And this offered a number of potential benefits to the owners. First of all, you get the excitement of a championship race. There's more control over salaries, again, because you have this registration at a league office. You reduce revenue uncertainty because now you have a fixed schedule. I mean, obviously there was lots of exhibition games, but now teams are knowing who they're gonna play. And, and lastly, and most importantly, is you actually get a chance to create franchise value. There's some value to actually being an exclusive member of this league as opposed to going from city to city with a bunch of players trying to make an income. Well, the idea of organized baseball, of leagues getting together, really started coming together in the 1880s. Once the National League started, it wasn't profitable right away, as, as John talked about, but other, other groups started to see the opportunity there, and as other teams started to try and form leagues, the National League responded with something called the League Alliance, and this was not a league in the sense that we understand leagues. It was simply the National League sort of charging teams a fee to be an, an allied member, if you will, and they basically said they wouldn't rate them for players, which they didn't really honor, and the only thing these teams really got was that the National League agreed not to play exhibition among two National League teams in their cities. So there was a number of rival leagues that were sort of coming and going, and sort of the key moment for organized baseball was Early in, the 18, early in 1883, as you guys all know, the American Association was actually successful as a competitive major league the year before. A.G. Mills, who was the, the president of the National League, decided to sort of take matters into his own hands. He got together and they created what was called the Tripartite Pact, which was sort of the start of what we now consider organized baseball, where he and the American Association and the Northwestern League, which was really the only other active league at the time, got together and said, we are gonna recognize each other's reserve lists. And as you guys remember, the reserve clause is the clause in a contract that essentially binds a player to that team forever. So once they acknowledge each other's reserve list, there was no longer sort of this bidding up of player salaries such as there was in 1882. And it was really the bidding up of salaries that caused teams to, to, to lose money. Although it's obviously much more fair to have free agency, teams really didn't know how to deal with it at the time. And the major leagues began to continue to take advantage and move of, of uh, take control over organized baseball. Uh, they, they started allowing other minor leagues in um, in 18, after the 1883 season. The name was changed to the National Agreement. And then in 1887, they actually started charging the minor leagues $250 a team to recognize their reserve clause, which was quite a bit of money to a minor league owner at the time. These teams were generally not capitalized with more than, say, $2,000. And I'm going to get into the numbers here in just a minute. Um, the minor leagues during the 1880s created very little franchise value. Teams disbanded and started with regularity. It was really hard to make it as a minor league. It didn't take much money to start, but it also the economics were, kind of, were, were fairly difficult. Um, for example, after the Minneapolis team folded, so they were in the Western Association at this time, um, late in the 1888 season, the rights to the Minneapolis franchise was sold to a group in Davenport for $500. So that gives you some idea of what a minor league franchise was worth at the time. And just, I'm gonna sort of put some context around this stuff here at the bottom in a minute, but for 1889 in the Western Association, the salary limit at the time was considered on a monthly basis, it was $2,250 which would be about $15,000 a year over a six-month season. Um, excuse me, about a little over $12,000 a year for a six-month season. Um, the way that teams looked at going on the road, you either got somewhere around 25% of the gate as a visiting team, 20 to 25% of the gate, or there was a guarantee fee. 
and leagues sort of changed from year to year what exactly they were doing. Um, for the Western Association, you can see that the guarantee fee was $100, which it was for most of the years going forward through the end of the, end of the 19th century. Uh, Denver was in the league that year, and because Denver was a lot farther to get to, it was, you, you were guaranteed $130 from the Denver team if you actually traveled all the way to Denver. And just as an aside, I thought this was interesting because I haven't ever seen much on umpire salaries. Uh, the, four ump the four umpires for the league was in 18 leagues. So you had four umpires. Well, uh, uh, there was just one umpire per game, and there were four games, uh, you know, uh, every, every, all the time. And it was $3,500. And so if you figure in travel expenses and stuff, that would be about $600 per year per umpire, which for a six-month job wasn't too bad if you look at other sort of, I, I did a little research, you know, a, a coal miner at the time in 1889 made about $360 a year. Uh, an iron and steel worker made about $550 a year. So $600 a year wasn't too bad, although um, being an umpire was pretty tough at the time. Uh, being the sole umpire, I mean, it was a lot harder than it is doing Little League today, and even that's pretty tough for a single umpire. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to talk about this in a second, but for 1891, the Western Association was actually almost on a near parity with the major leagues with the national agreement that came out of the 1890 season. And the reason that happened is that, as you guys all know, during the 1890 season, there was the Players League War. Uh, the National League lost something like $400,000. The Players League lost something like $300,000. But the Western Association teams actually pretty much broke even. Um, the Des Moines Club went bust and moved to Lincoln, and that team lost about $8,000 for the, for the year. But in general, I mean, the league made $6,000, and because of that, when the, when the national agreement was re-signed after the 1890 season, heading into 1891, the three signatories to the agreement were the American Association, the National League, and the Western Association. All the other minor leagues were then below that. Um, the other thing, though, of course, is the American Association, as you guys know, backed out because they thought the National League was stealing some players that were rightfully belonging to there. So the national agreement for 1891 was simply the National League and the Western Association were the two main signatories, and then the other minor leagues came on below that. Um, so what does it look like for, what did it look like, what did people think 1891 was going to be in the Western Association? And this here, the Lincoln, so Lincoln had a team, Des Moines had moved there, and this is the Lincoln correspondent to Sporting Life estimating what the economics of a team was going to look like. And the interesting thing to me here, well, first of all, the, a lot of other writers criticized him as underestimating it. So, I'll t so I sort of made some tweaks here to try and give a better picture. So assuming you got 55,000 patrons, the idea was the typical ticket was 25 cents in the minor leagues. It was 50 cents in the National League for almost all the cities. And then, you know, for the grandstand. So the idea here is you get about 34 cents per patron. And other, other sort of research that I've been able to find uh, um, confirms that, that you can think of about 33 to 34 cents per patron on a minor league game. And then you look at what the expenses are. It's about $4,500 traveling expenses. The salary limit in 1891 in the league was $2,000. And the interesting thing here is that all the teams blew through it. All the teams blew through it. You had competition in 1891. Again, remember, we have the American Association breaking away from the agreement, so salaries were all driven way up, and a lot of people were saying this was going to happen. And then, two, in the, the correspondent did not include the grounds cost in his estimate, so I put that in there, $2,500, which was fairly typical. You're either going to rent a stadium, you're going to have security, you're going to have ticket takers, things like that. And so you can see that running a team is a fairly much a break-even proposition unless you're getting more than about 55,000 patrons. Just to give a little bit of context, so remember, we're looking at about $19,000, call $20,000 in expenses, $12,000 in salaries. Just to give a little bit of context, Here's a couple of major league uh, expenses and salaries that I found. So you, you got to remember that um, the estimate is that salaries fell about 30% from the early 1890s to the middle of the 1890s, going back to what John was talking about, as the National League sort of took control of the monopoly. And so, you know, typical uh, expenses maybe for a major league team was in that 30 to thirty to sixty thousand dollars whereby a minor league team might be around twenty thousand dollars for total expenses um, 
the 1891 season was a financial disaster for almost all the minor leagues. The Western League, four teams folded before the end of the year, and it was basically because of these high salaries, it was a disaster. So for 1892, the, the, major, the minor leagues, led by the Western League and the Eastern League, actually embarked on what was called the Millennium Plan. And Francis Richter had talked about this in The Sporting Life. Francis Richter was the editor of Sporting Life magazine. And in the late 1880s, he talked about a plan where the leagues would actually sign the players, and then they would allocate teams to the various cities simply randomly. They'd sign the players, they tried to create eight equal teams, and then randomly assign them to the teams. And the minor leagues actually, so you, there were 96, this was 12 players per team, eight teams, that's 96 players, a $2,000 salary limit, so that's $96,000. And the league signed the teams, allocated them to the various franchises in 1892. Well, not surprisingly, this was disaster number two because nobody was really interested in a random team of 12 players. And every team in the Western League had lost two to five thousand dollars, which is a lot of money when you're totally when you're capitalized at somewhere around two to three thousand dollars in total. It lost two to five thousand dollars by the middle of June. The Columbus team, which actually ran away with the pennant, which is sort of odd given they were trying to equalize the teams, the Columbus team actually was said to be one of the worst teams in terms of revenue of all time. They they lost eight thousand dollars, and their expenses were were $11,000. So that means that their revenue was only $3,000. So for three months, the Columbus team only took in a total of $3,000. And I'll give a little bit of context, but clearly that nobody is coming to these games. Some people talked about the fact that I guess the weather in the middle of, in, in early 1892 was supposed to be terrible, but it wasn't just the Western League that failed. All the leagues that went on to the Millennium Plan, the Eastern League, the minor leagues, they all basically said, this is not working. Well, after the d dual disasters of 1891 and 1892, there was actually um, no Western League in 1893. Um, they, they, this is inside. They changed the name from the Western Association to the Western League from 1891 to 1892. And there was no league in 1893. Finally, in 1894, um, with Ban Johnson and several of the uh, others they d as the, hired as the league president, they decided to take another shot at this. And in fact, 1894, it was really competitive for the National, for, for the Western League. They did really well. So I'm going to compare this to the National League, for which we have some numbers. Part of the reason is that they actually sort of had a proto revenue sharing plan in 1894. Essentially, 10% of the receipts went to the league and then were redistributed to the eight teams equally, um, or the 12 teams in the National League. So there was this sort of proto-revenue sharing plan of 10% of the receipts. And the interesting thing is that they published what these 10% of the receipts that were coming into the league office was. So if you multiply by 10, you actually can figure out what the receipts of these teams were. And in the Western League, the average receipts for a team was about $30,000. Remember, we looked at Lincoln in 1891. They were assuming about 20000 So clearly, these teams are doing a little bit better than, 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 than that was projected. And because a lot of it was Ben Johnson kind of knowing how to get some discipline in, in, in among his owners. So I compared that to the National League. And remember, the National League is 12 teams. So if you, if you take out the top four teams and you just compare the Western League to the bottom eight teams of the National League, um, which is, seems to me a fairly reasonable comparison, you can see that the eight remaining National League teams had about a $40,000 in receipts. So that the Western League was at 75% of what the National League was, which to me is sort of phenomenal when you're comparing sort of a, a, a large regional minor league to the major leagues and all their advantages. Um, that, that, like the major leagues, teams continued during the 1890s receipts declined as both from the recession and from the fact that the National League was so screwed up that you know, sort of it, it hurt interest in baseball generally. 1896, you can see the teams had fallen from about $29,000 in receipts to about $22,000 in receipts. But because salaries had fallen commensurately by about 30%, that most of these teams could at least make money or break even with only $22,000 in receipts. 
the other thing, I, I managed to find a little bit of Western League attendance. Um, this is for 1870, 1897 and 1898. And once again, if you sort of do the comparison with the bottom eight teams in the National League to make it a little bit sort of comparing eight teams to eight teams, you, you can see that it's, it's not an order of magnitude difference. If you take 1898, for example, which was the Spanish-American War, and baseball attendance everywhere uh, went down significantly for the Western League. Ben Johnson saw this coming. He told his teams to sort of plan for this, to reduce expenses, to figure out how to sort of create other ways to um, get fans. And as you can see, that for the Western League, the attendance fell much less than it did for the National League. And in fact, you know, in 1898, the Western League's attendance is about 75% of the National League's bottom eight teams, which again, I think is, shows just how far the Western League had come from these disasters of 1891 and 1892. Well, because we're talking about the Midwest, I wanted to talk about, so here's a lower league. This is the Class B. So, this is, so the Western League is Class A, Western Association is Class B. Um, so in the 1890s, this would have been a league of Des Moines. It had Lincoln at that time, Peoria, um, gives you some sense. It's sort of smaller Midwestern cities. Travel was generally estimated for the minor leagues at about two cents per mile per man. You had room and board was about two dollars per day per man. That's generally about a buck and a quarter for room and 75 cents for food. Uh, the payroll, instead of being two thousand dollars a month, is nine hundred dollars a month, and we're looking at a five-month season. Um, uniforms and equipment, and then um, then the payroll also includes a manager at about a thousand dollars and some bonuses. And grounds, again, right around that $2,500 to $2,600 is what it takes to run the ground. So here, we're looking at $12,000 for the expenses for the Western Association. Again, think of $20,000 for a Class A team. And then here is the next lowest league, which is really these state leagues. So here's the Montana State League, and uh, the expenses for a state league are probably $7,000. Um, you're looking at most state leagues had, had, were lower than $900 a month for their, for their salary limits. And just interestingly, because it was there, the biggest gate was $634 on July 29th, and there was two dates in the Montana State League where Great Falls in 1900 only got $47.50 in receipts at the gate. Um, and then one more thing here. This is another sort of state. This is the state league example. Here's the Illinois-Iowa League. Um, the idea that these leagues did was you tried to make, you tried to break even on the road and then with your home attendance you would pay your salaries and hopefully make a little profit. And again, you can see here that uh, for this league that's a $40 is the gate guarantee as opposed to something larger. And, you know, I think these expenses are probably underestimated. It doesn't include the train trip. So this is a train trip from Peoria to Joliet and then to Illinois. By the, and then back to Peoria. The cost of going back to Peoria isn't here, but I think that the main thing is you can get some idea of the order of magnitude of what it cost to take these trains around and go on the road and play minor league baseball at the time. Um, what I want to talk about now, just quickly before I, I, I wrap up, is the, is the major league minor league draft, because that had a huge impact on minor league economics. And the National League really reasserted control over, major, over the organized baseball in the 1890s. They first, the first time the draft was introduced, was an, it was after the 1890 season, before 1891, and then they sort of redid it in 1892, and they redid it several times since. And essentially the way it was in, during most of the 1890s was that they paid $500 to draft a player from Class A, $250 for Class B, and then it was, the numbers went down from there for lower leagues. And this would happen after the season in a, in, a, in, a, in a window where they could draft. And the key thing is that there was no limit to the number of players that could be drafted. And $500 was a low number for the time. So, for example, when Joe Quinn, who was on Des Moines in the late, 1890, late 1880s, was sold to Boston, he was sold for $2,500. So to have to give up good players for $500 was clearly hurting these minor leagues. And what this led to was farming, and you know, John talked about John Brush. So John Brush owned the Cincinnati team in the National League, and he owned Indianapolis in the Western League. And what he would do is he would draft players as, from Western League teams and then 
send them to the Indianapolis team. And so the Indianapolis team was winning pennants during the 1890s because their owner was using the draft to suck players out of other teams and then putting them in, in Indianapolis. And that, that obviously was something that, that really bothered all the other Western League teams and certainly was part of what led them to want to have their own separate, um, you know, put, had Ben Johnson push when he finally tried to form the American League. The other thing that it did is it, it was called, it caused salary imbalances. So like in the Virginia State League, there was a couple of bigger cities like Richmond that would take teams from major leagues. And when a player was sent down, he, he was, his, his salary was higher. If you drafted a player, you had to have a, a higher salary. And so in some of these state leagues, you'd have some teams that had salary limits or salaries much higher, salary lists, payrolls much higher than in other, uh, than in other, than other teams. And we create this incredible imbalance within minor leagues as well. One, of, one big example of this was the Minneapolis team in 1896, which won the Western League pennant. Um, five of their t players were drafted after the season. Um, all their good players, effectively, Perry Worden, who had a great season, as you guys might know, Bill Hutchinson, who was the best pitcher in the Western League that year. In fact, the um, Minneapolis team was able to hold on to Hutchinson by providing outfielder Dan Lally instead. And the Minneapolis owner, in a, in a long sort of plaintive letter to the national board, which was the governing body, um, said that he had spent $17,500 to redo the stadium. And now the fact that the, the team was decimated, he was losing money hand over fist. And he also said he had to spend $5,000 to replace these players. And again, he's losing them and only getting $500 for them. So you can just see that how hard it was to be a minor league operator under these sort of rules at the time, although most of them could, could figure out ways to, to eke out, um, especially in the Western League, to make a profit. Um, I don't know if you guys can see this cartoon, but this is John Brush standing uh, on, on, the, on the left there saying, you fellas knuckle under or I'll, and then it's the, the, the other folks are the national, those are the various minor leagues, and they're saying, not on your life, John T., the public is with us. Well, the public may have been with them, but it didn't help. Um, at least for a few years g going forward. So to, to wrap up, the uh, confusion in the late, 1990, late 1890s really catalyzed the modern era. First of all, the Spanish-American War led to many league failures and large losses among the National League teams. Um, ben Johnson managed to get Chicago, get a, get a, as John was talking about, get a team in Chicago for the 1900 season. And the machinations that got him there was really fascinating, and that, that took a lot of sort of work on Van Johnson to get the National League to actually agree to allow him to do that. But that really set him up to challenge the National League. And then from this part of the world, from my talk, really the most important thing was that the miners got together in 1901 and formed the National Association. So the American League, obviously, when they challenged the National League, they abrogated the National Agreement. The National League then said they weren't going to honor it. And so essentially everybody was raiding the minor leagues for all their players. And the, in, in, in 1901, under Thomas Hickey, the leagues got together and said, we're going to bargain as a group. And so when there was finally peace in 1903, it was the National League, the American League, and the National Association that were the three signatories. And the, and the minor leagues finally sort of had some way to create franchise value. And this was then the forward going forward it was the, it was this, it was until sort of the 1930s and the 1940s came along, this was the organization, the system that ruled uh, organized baseball, and in fact, the minor leaguers began to be able to create some franchise value. Thank you. Yeah, I hadn't realized 1891, you said the high salaries, uh, and that was coming out of the Players League. Um, so what was it that the American Association didn't have the same relationship with the National League or kind of broke free that year? Yeah, so the Players League drove up salaries, and then in 1891 it was another sort of wildcat year because the American Association felt that the National League did not um, that they stole some of the players out of the Players League that were rightfully belonging to American Association teams. And so they withdrew from the national agreement. So once again, in 1891, for a second year in a row, 
you had competition for player salaries as nobody honored anybody else's reserve clause. So 1891 was very much like 1890 in that the teams all lost money because they were uh, they were battling for you know they were they were challenging each other for players. How many leagues were there in the National Association? You mean when they in, in, in 1901? In when 19, they, 1901 when they formed yeah, the National. Was, how many leagues, leagues, different leagues were there in there? there? I, I don't have the exact number. It was probably seven to ten. In the 1890s, you were talking about Class A and Class B. Who decided those decisions on who's in what league? And how did they decide that? What were the factors? There was, um, so the national agreement um, basically created a board. It was essentially um, people, it was the National League president and other National League owners. There was a couple of minor league uh, people who were associated with it, but the national board was really National League owners. And the other thing I would just add is that the Class A teams could draft from the Class B leagues. So there was some advantage to being a Class A league because you could, you could as well draft from lower minor leagues, and lower minor leagues were often complaining about higher minor leagues drafting from them. The, the, the key thing that the new national agreement did in, in 1903 um, was that it limited the number of players that could be drafted from a minor league team. You couldn't simply just go take whoever you wanted. There was limits of, depending on the league and the year, it was typically two players. So you had mentioned the... Uh... 25 cent ticket price and then the Indianapolis club had a 33 cent per patron and it got me thinking about concessions and ancillary revenues I know today we all know that at the, going to the ballpark concessions are such a huge thing and I was wondering if you could speak to what that looked like back then and, and where those revenues were and, and what was available and how big of a part of, of uh, the money that might have been or might not have been uh, it was very small so just as an aside I mean I think you, you want the, mo almost all tickets were 25 cents. There were some grandstand seats that were a little bit more, which brought up the average. No, there, there were concessions. I've seen um, um, more on the major league averages where it's, you know, a couple thousand dollars. So if total receipts for a major league club are, you know, 55 to 60 grand, and Mike probably has some better deeds, the, the concessions may be 500 to 1,000. Were there players who sort of tanked their performance, or were there managers, owners who helped tank it, or... Were, did they find some illegal other ways to sort of pay them so it didn't show up in the revenue stream or lack thereof? Um, no, I mean, essentially people just did it above board. I mean, these people weren't publishing their books. And, you know, the, part of the reason they went to the Millennium Plan was to enforce the $2,000 a month salary limit. So, no, if teams were in the minor leagues were paying more than $2,000 a month, they were just kind of getting away with it because um, nobody really knew they, how much everybody was making. I noticed that Minneapolis was more profitable than St. Paul in one of your uh, graphs. Were there more heavyweight people involved in Minneapolis? Were there heavyweights? Were the pills? Were there any names that we might know that were involved in baseball? Um, you, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know that well. I mean, Baron Hawk was one of the owners of the Minneapolis team, and he, he was a fairly well-known guy about town. Uh, the, the, there was, I'm, I'm, I'm trying, it was one of the years in the, eight, in the early 1890s where when the leagues were reforming and the Minneapolis, they couldn't find an owner for St. Paul, and the Minneapolis owners were told they had to fund a St. Paul owner as well to be able to, 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 to be picked as the owner as opposed to a rival group. And then they actually found some people in Milwaukee who would fund a St. Paul team. So it was generally harder to find people to fund teams in St. Paul, which I think may be part of the reason that Van Johnson was so excited to have Comiskey come over. So I, many, many, in general, Minneapolis had, was, had an easier time finding people to fund the teams, at least in the early 1890s. Okay. This will be the last question. Uh, Dan, how did the fans keep track of what was going on? Was it covered well in the papers, the Star Tribune uh, radio? Uh, was there coverage there? How did they keep track? The fans, uh, the fans generally kept track through, through the newspapers. I mean, I, I would say one of the things that led to the whole idea that you could have leagues was a couple of technological issues that came. One was sort of the telegraph, which allowed, you know, to have the next, if you were buying a morning paper, you, you could have yesterday's score, um, so that you could get it in the next day's paper, which was relatively recent. And then the other was railroad travel, where you couldn't really have leagues unless it was relatively efficient to get between these cities. But teams would, players, 
people would generally follow it through the, through the newspaper. There were also two sporting newspapers at the time. Um, sporting News started in 1886, which was a weekly, and Sporting Life started, I think, in 1883, and it was a weekly, and they both covered sports, um, not just baseball, but, you know, bicycling and all the other stuff that was going on as well. So our next presenter is going to be Mike Halpert. And Mike is and I share something in common, and that is that we are both river rats. So he's from La Crosse, Wisconsin, and I'm from Winona. And um, being river towns, they were very, very important. Before there were roads, before there were railroads in Minnesota, ball players actually didn't take the trains. They would take the steamboats. And the steamboats would arrive in town to the sound of their steam calliopes. And if you've never heard one, it's, it's just this ungodly racket that echoes in the canyon that, is the, that the bluffs form along the Mississippi River. So you know that the, that the, the boats are arriving. And it's a big deal, and people would run down, and the newspapers all covered who arrived, what arrived. Uh, what were people wearing when they got off the boat? And uh, yes, indeed, there was a game played of baseball down at the Levee Park. So these are the kinds of things that were going on along the river. And uh, Mike, is, uh, Mike Halpert and the Saber chapter here, Halsey Hall, have a long history of doing different joint events down in La Crosse, Wisconsin, because it's a beautiful little town to go to. Today, Mike is going to be talking about the serious business, seriously? The serious business of play, developing professional baseball in the upper Midwest in the 19th century. Please give a welcome to Mike. And let's be patient just for a moment while he switches over to his PowerPoint presentation. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. It's, it's so nice to be here, and I uh, thank you very much for all the people who organized this and uh, allowed me to come and, and talk to an audience that isn't a bunch of 19-year-olds who just want to get to lunch. Instead, it's a bunch of more than 19-year-olds who just want to get to lunch. So, <laughs> I was asked uh, about the connection between my talk and uh, my regalia, and it was this was the sweatshirt hanging in my closet when I woke up this morning, which is why I have this pirate sweatshirt on. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the business side of baseball um, because every time I go to Cooperstown, my wife says, you're not going to work, you're going to play, and you're not fooling anyone. And I haven't fooled anyone yet, but it sure is fun to think about the business of playing here. So just as a quick overview, uh, what I want to talk about is the growing demand for entertainment. That's what baseball is. It's part of the entertainment business, and that's how we see it growing because the availability for entertainment is what grew so dramatically in the 19th century that allowed baseball to become a successful business. So uh, since baseball is entertainment, what I really want to talk about then is the growth of baseball as a business. What allowed that to happen, how it happened, and I have a few figures up here which will show you how quickly that happened. And as was alluded to earlier by both John and Dan, uh, William Hulbert, when he started the National League, uh, really did build a model for all successful sports franchises in the United States. So the reason that we see an increased demand for baseball, which allowed it to become a successful business, was because of the increased demand for entertainment. And the number one reason for that was the increased incomes that we're going to see and the decreased work weeks. So during the 19th century, not only were people's wages going up, but the amount of time that they needed to earn those higher wages was actually going down fairly dramatically. And as an economist will point out, there are only two things you can do with your time. You can either work or you can not work. And not working is what we all aspire to do. So that's where we get our leisure time. 
And then there are a number of other things that also helped with the entertainment industry, one of which is the overall growth of population, but more importantly for entertainment was that it was becoming more and more urbanized. And I think this is really one of the key differences between what Dan was talking about with the difficulty of minor league teams, which tended to be in more uh, rural areas and smaller cities, the difficulty they had making money. And as you're going to see um, the evidence I'm going to show you, how major league teams at the highest level really did very well during this period of time with you know, the occasional depression which caused problems. The long run trend was, was dramatically upward. But they're also in larger cities where uh, population is starting to congregate. So we're seeing a much bigger move from the rural areas into the larger cities. And that helps in the entertainment industry a lot. And then another thing that helps, and this was already alluded to as well, is a decreased cost of transportation. Not only moving top entertainment from one city to another, so that if I'm in Chicago, I can see the best ball players from Boston and New York. I can also see the best actors from Boston and New York because they can come by train. But within cities, with the rise of streetcars and with the rise of, um, you know, uh, motorized traffic and more congested uh, living, it was easier to get to these things. Um, I remember my wife's grandfather telling me all the time when he was a huge baseball fan and he used to talk about going from Blooming Prairie to Rochester to see a ball game and it would take two and a half hours because that's how long it took a horse to go, 80 miles. And I thought, God, I drove up here in two and a half hours and I'm not even going to see a ball game, but at least I get to talk about baseball. So. <laughs> So let's take a look at what was happening here in the leisure industry, or the, uh, for the entertainment industry. This blue line is the growth of wages over time. And uh, this is what I believe, yeah, these are what are called real wages. In other words, I adjusted this for inflation. So this reflects the buying power of your work. And the green line here and the dots, you know, uh, on the left side show the average number of hours that the average American worked per week. And so this roughly runs from, uh, what, 1865 to 1915, so a 50-year period. And you can see that the average work week dropped dramatically while the average wage was going up. So not only are you spending a lot less time doing your work, but you're making a substantial amount of money more. Now, this mostly had to do with technology, which was making each worker more valuable. But we don't care about why. We just care that it was happening because this is what's driving the increased demand for entertainment. People have more time and they have more money to spend. And technology, which is making me more productive at work and giving me a better pay, is also giving me less time it takes to do some of my work in the house as well. Because some of the you know, big inventions in the 19th century, like uh, a water pump inside the house. Okay? And then if we take a look at a couple of broad categories, here's some, some example on the expenditures on selected recreation items. And you can see the blue one here includes sporting goods. The red one is music. So we were much more musical society back in the 19th century. And then bicycles, for some reason, were not included in sporting goods. The census pulled them out when they asked people about their expenditures. So we can see this blip that was referred to earlier in the 1890s. And one of the threats to baseball is bicycling was hugely popular in the mid-1890s. And it started to fall off in terms of what people were spending and the time they were spending on doing it. But the construction of velodromes and the number of bicycles and... I've read a couple of great biographies in the last year about people who rode these, you know, great big bicycles, you know, the great big front wheel, all the way across the United States. And it never occurred to me until I read those things that they didn't have any brakes. So when you were going downhill, you looped your legs over the top and hoped to hell you didn't hit a rock. So it turns out baseball is way less dangerous as well. Now, if we look at employment in some entertainment industries here, um, the black line is athletes. So these are professional athletes. And then professional musicians, professional dancers, and actors. And you can see this upward trend for all of these things. So entertainment is becoming a viable business, not just in sports, but in a lot of areas. We have the time, we have the money, and it leads to people looking to try and make a dollar, and they have to hire some workers to do it. And so that's what we're seeing here. So now if we focus just on popularity of baseball, the growing popularity of baseball can be measured by the increase in attendance. We can take a look at it by looking at the stadiums, the bigger and better stadiums. And we can also look at it by taking a look at the profits and the salaries that are earned by players. And then I'll talk a little bit about what some of the things were done, were, uh, were being done 
to build the baseball market, to, to really you know, foster that and get people to take their entertainment time and money and spend it on baseball, spending it at the ballpark instead of at the theater or on a bicycle. So the first thing we can look at is just attendance at Major League Baseball. So this includes all the different major leagues that we have, you know, that uh, will count the Union Association, the Players League, etc. This does not count at all any minor leagues. So you can see, you know, the ups and downs here are due to league foldings and depressions, but the general, general trend over this time is certainly upward and dramatically so once we hit the 20th century and the National League and the American League you know, quit fighting with one another and start to cooperate. If we think about baseball stadiums, you know, just a, a few slides here, and I'm going to tread very lightly on any Minneapolis stadiums because, uh, you know, five feet to my right is a man who's forgotten more about Minneapolis stadiums than I've ever known. But, uh, you know, this was a fairly typical stadium in the early day. You know, you might have a, a covered grandstand there, a few hundred people, and maybe some gamblers, you know, floating around down there. My favorite stadium is the Union Grounds, which didn't last very long. It's number three here, and in this picture it's drawn completely opposite the way it actually was. Uh, that's where the, my favorite team, the uh, White Stockings, now Cubs, started out their career, and then, of course, it burned to the ground before the season ended. It was replaced then by Lakefront Park, which was a nicer, bigger, you know, better facility than the one before it. Eventually it moved to Westside Park, which was even bigger and better, and... Uh, Cubs actually played their first World Series there, and then I waited 108 years to see him play another one. <laughs> then, of course, if we go more locally, there's Athletic Park here in Minneapolis and Nicolet Park uh, in Minneapolis. But um, when we think about baseball, we really think about the money here. And I was able to estimate the profits of some teams, given the scant records that we have of revenues and expenses. Uh, these are just for some major league franchises. And you can see that, you know, aside from a couple of, you know, bad years here, and, and you want to be careful when looking at this data because for, for most cases it's an individual team in an individual year that I was able to find information for. So the fact that the profits plummet in 1880, 1881 uh, isn't necessarily due to baseball falling off, but rather the one or two teams that I have data for having a bad year. Uh, so you can see that, you know, certainly profits are there to be made. And in fact... Um, Profits were seen derisively in some cases. The Boston Herald, you know, decried the Chicago White Stockings when they were starting up as merely a money-making concern, as if, you know, as if that was a bad thing, right, to start a business and make money on it. <laughs> so they started their team in 1871 in the National Association, and before the season was out, you know, three-quarters of the city downtown was burned to the ground. Uh, it was a devastating loss for the White Stockings. The ballpark burned down, the clubhouse burned down, and it turns out that most of the players lost their homes as well because they all lived near there. Uh, they lost all their equipment, all their uniforms, and yet amazingly, they still made a $2,000 profit that season. Three years later, they returned to action, finished in fifth place, and made even more money that year. But I think something that tells the whole story about the Chicago White Stockings is the fact that just because their ballpark burned down didn't mean that their business was going to stop. They played the rest of the season on the road, and this is one of my favorite team pictures of all time. Those are the players wearing the team uniforms from five different teams that had extra uniforms and loaned them to the White Stockings, who would then play, you know, in an Athletics uniform and a Mutuals uniform and a Red Stockings uniform to finish out the season. Now, the profits were there for the teams, but the players also did very well. This is the ratio of player salaries to the average American manufacturing wage during this time. And what's really impressive about this, not only do you notice here that, you know, this is the ratio down here along the uh, vertical axis, not only were they making anywhere from 2 to 16 times what the average American was making, they were doing that in six months. So almost all of these players would then get another job for the rest of the year, and they'd make salary as well. So these salaries are impressive, but they're even more impressive when you think that they're only working half as long as their next door neighbor to make two to 16 times as much money. So baseball has always been a pretty good business, as Honus Wagner said, as long as you can get the business. So being a ball player is a good gig, as long as you're a ball player is exactly what Honus Wagner said. So there are some financial figures for teams. So let's take a look here at how profitable the Boston team was during the 1870s, um, and that should actually say, oh, I accidentally copied the 1872 twice down here, so you can ignore that bottom line. 
the return to capital. So Dan had you know mentioned uh, you know capitalizing these teams. Uh, major league teams, so the teams at the top, were capitalized in a lot more money. They tended to be capitalized in the early days at twenty-five thousand, and later a hundred thousand dollars. So a return to capital is basically what profit are you earning on that original investment? Well, as you can see here, um, in the first year that we have these returns for Boston, they made a sixty-four percent return. A five percent return is pretty good. Okay, if you're earning five percent, you're generally making a good living. And as you can see. They were earning well over 5% in almost every year. There's only a couple of years where they were earning very little. And in fact, they never lost money during this decade. Okay? So Boston was doing quite well. And I think uh, John had mentioned earlier, Boston was one of, you know, this is a little misleading because Boston and Chicago were, were among two teams that almost never lost money. But the point is, they were making really good money here. Okay? So if you're making... 58%, you're basically paying off your capitalization in two years. And then everything from then on is really padding your pockets here. So we can also look at uh, another team that we have some financial data for is the Providence uh, team in 1883. And we have a little more detail here, uh, some of the receipts and some of the expenditures. And they turned a profit of about $4,600. If I recall, this team was uh, capitalized at $50,000. So that's not quite a 10% return um, you know, to capital in one year. Uh, this is a snapshot. I don't have any other data for Providence. Uh, this just happens to be one example. Um, the Chicago team also, I didn't, I didn't load up with a whole bunch of numbers here, but the Chicago team was also quite well. We have a lot of financial figures for them. And once Chicago rebuilt their stadium and started up, particularly when William Hulbert took over the team, Chicago made good money every year that they were in existence. So if we take a look at another way to uh, consider how well the baseball business is going, let's take a look at how much teams were selling for. So Dan talked about the difficulty of really establishing the value of a franchise in the minor leagues. It wasn't very difficult in the major leagues once the National League got started and they were able to establish a monopoly league, a league with no competitors, a league which they established as being clearly above everything else. It became a desirable place to be, and teams were making money. The best way to figure out whether teams are making money is to see if the person who owned the team can sell it for a profit later on. And in general, that's exactly what we see. So when we look at the sale of teams over time, we see that they were generally increasing over the 19th century. When we look at capitalizing teams and when we look at what leagues were charging to enter the league, the National Association required a $10 league entry fee. The National League required a $100 league entry fee. By the time you get into the 20th century, you're looking at thousands of dollars just to enter the league. You get nothing for that. You just get access to those kind of profits. So baseball recognized that there was an increasing amount of money and time that people had for leisure activities. And so they did a good job at competing for that time and for those dollars. So let me just run through some of the things that we see that baseball was doing their innovation to try and attract those dollars and those hours from people. So this is uh, where I used to live in St. Louis. Uh, Sportsman's Park is no longer there. But if you look really closely with this, you know, uh, bicycle, that's, that's actually a velodrome there. You can see the bicycles riding around. Um, Chris Vondra also thought, well, gee, you know, I've got a, a saloon across the street. I've got this great place with a zoo out here in left field and a velodrome. Why not throw a baseball field in there and get people to come and do that, too? So uh, I like to think that he was way ahead of the Arizona Diamondbacks who put a swimming pool in center field and a restaurant up in the left field corner. Uh, you know, and then once in a while, people would come and watch baseball as well. But uh, baseball really became a business, as far as I'm concerned, in 1862 when William Kammeyer built a fence around the grounds and said, if hey, people are going to stand around here, I'm going to make them pay to come in and see this. Okay? And so when we start charging admission, that's clearly when we're going from the idea that this is a gentlemanly game where people are just going to have fun and they're coming out for a social activity to somebody saying, I can make money on this. That's when it becomes a business. And that's when we really see that. So other innovations, well, obviously professional players. The whole idea behind professional players is I want to draw the best people in. It's the difference between going to a Broadway show and going down the street to the high school. Well, you're going to see the same play. What's the difference? Well, if you go to a Broadway show, you are seeing the best of the best. And that's the very idea that Major League Baseball has started. The 1869 Red Stocking started that by saying, hey, 
we're going to get the best people and we're going to get them to devote all their time to doing this one thing that they're really good at. Well, in economics, we call that a comparative advantage. If you're good at something, that's what you should spend your time doing. If you can pitch a ball well and hit a ball well, that's what you should spend your time doing. And I think I can make money off of your efforts at doing that, so I'm willing to pay you to do that. And I'm willing to pay the best people to do it the best because then I can sell that ticket more easily. When I come to town, I can say, these are the best players in the country. I'm paying them a very good salary to do this. Come on out and see them, and I'll sell that ticket to you. So this is, this is basically the whole idea that William Hulbert was selling when he put the National League together. There's a long story about the problems with the National Association at the time, but the real driving force, I would argue, between, behind the National League was less the problems with the National Association and more the potential with the National League. So Hulbert saw the potential of reorganizing the way that professional baseball was done, and that's what was going to make it profitable. The territorial exclusivity, the fixed schedules, the uniform contracts, the roster for umpires, the reserve clause, which came along a few years later. These are all solid bearings of any professional league for the next century. It wasn't until the 1970s that we really see real changes in these things, and it's still the foundation. We don't have a reserve clause per se, but all players are still bound to their team for a certain period of time before they get to be free agents. As a Cubs fan, I know this very painfully right now as we're watching the core of our team be passed up by the Brewers of all people. <laughs> of course, Hulbert also focused on some of the business changes. Key among them was the separation of management and labor. Again, from an economic perspective, have people do what they're best at doing. Don't have the players trying to manage the league and run the teams. Put them on the field where they're the best players. We'll let the businessmen manage the team and run the league. So there was that separation in the National League. Players were forbade from owning their teams by Hulbert. And the first thing he did when he recruited uh, Albert Spaulding was give him some stock in the team. So he was also big on not poaching players from other teams, but he didn't announce that until after he'd poached some of the best red stockings to come to Chicago. <laughs> he was also big on eliminating competing leagues, and so he would use things like you know, the international agreement where we'll, we'll let you pay us not to steal your players. It keeps the competition down, it keeps the best players with us, and it's good business sense to have other people paying you not to do things. It's always the best thing. Standardized contracts also eliminated players jumping from team to team. It eliminated some of the competition for salaries, which lowered costs, which for any businessman also made good sense. No small towns. So we aren't going to be playing in little towns. We're going to go to where the audiences are. We're going to go to where the money is. We're going to go to where the money can be made. It doesn't pay me to drive from Chicago to Fort Wayne, Indiana and play in front of 500 people. I want to drive from Chicago to New York and play in front of 5,000 people. That's where I'm going to make my profits. So the National League also focused. They had a minimum attendance clause, which was immediately, again, broken when they allowed New Haven in, but that was for good political connections. And then, of course, increased admission fees, and then no Sunday ball. That was to help win some PR battles out there. It would ultimately, you know, that and no alcohol sales at the ball game. These were all, you know, PR movements that were made. But the business continues 365 days a year. So one of the things that's frequently done by Hulbert was to figure out what they could use the ballpark for during the off-season. So they would rent out the grounds for circuses. They would flood it for ice skating rinks. That's what you see here. Uh, it was very common for baseball stadiums to be flooded for ice skating rinks during the winter. So the ballpark could be used as a source of revenue in and of itself, which is one of the reasons that it, it was a good idea to build a nice and grand ballpark, something that would attract fans, especially as Hulbert was very keen on doing he copied this from vaudeville. If you put a good and wholesome product on the field, you can draw a lot more people because you won't get just men. You can also get women to come. So having seat cushions and having shaded areas to sit, having less rowdy drinking, having fewer gamblers, having baseball not on a Sunday when it was supposed to be a family day, these were all very clever marketing techniques that worked very well to get baseball in the forefront of people's minds as a wholesome place to go. It brought a lot of people in, and it turned out to be very profitable. So we see the evolution of Ladies' Day. Eventually, uh, you know, beer did come into the ballpark. You know, you can't even imagine a ballpark now without beer. 
But, you know, the National League originally didn't allow beer, and this is one of the arguments for why Cincinnati wanted out of the National League, because Cincinnati was one of the biggest brewery cities, and imagining baseball without beer was like imagining baseball without steroids in the 1990s. Uh, double headers were evolved. Um, so ultimately, throughout the latter half of the 19th century then, what we find is that with the growth of the leisure industry, baseball marketed itself and positioned itself well. It was profitable. The quality of the play increased because of professional players, which further increased the popularity. But ultimately, why baseball? Well, Americans had that leisure time, as I said, and they purchased the entertainment, but it could have come from anywhere. I like to go to my two of my favorite authors to figure out why it was baseball. And one of them is Mark Twain, who really described, I think, the 19th century very well, whether he's describing the economy or baseball, when he said, baseball is the very symbol the outward and physical expression of the drive and push and rush, the struggle of the raging, tearing, booming 19th century. And if we come more 20th century, to more, uh, uh, more uh, up to date, Roger Angel has my absolute favorite quote about baseball. Since baseball time is measured only in outs, all you have to do is succeed utterly. Keep hitting, keep the rally alive, and you have defeated time. You remain forever young, and that's baseball. Thank you very much. We have some time for questions. Test, test. Okay. What was the uh, pricing structure like for the highest what we would call luxury boxes, luxury seats, semi-private suites um, at some of those old, old ballparks? In the National League, uh, tickets were uniformly set at 50 cents. Now, you know, at, at ballparks like, you know, in Chicago, you might rent a seat cushion or you might pay more for a shaded seat. But typically, those were sold on season tickets. And so a season ticket would cost $15, and that would admit you to all of the games, which were usually about 40 home games. At least in Boston, as I think uh, the years went on, there was more media coverage of baseball, too. I assume that's both cause and effect of baseball's popularity, but would be interested if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, um, who depends more on the other one, sports or the media? And you could argue that today. Anything that they could do to get uh, media reports was good publicity. And especially if you could get people to report on the results of your game, that's free publicity. So... Typically what would happen is, as people became more interested in something, newspapers would want to sell newspapers, and so they would go to that. So in the 1880s, we saw the rise of newspapers which only covered sports. That's how popular sports were becoming. So I think, you know, I think the chicken here that came first was the sports, and the egg was the media finding another way to make dollars. So again, if, if uh, sports don't become popular, the newspapers aren't going to be able to sell that. But I think the newspapers kind of followed along that. There was the National League before there was the Sporting News, for example. Um, actually, just building off that question, talking about the media, um, at what point did the idea of like the beat writer come into play? I mean, how was that coverage done? Did they have local writers, and was it passed along? Could you speak to that? I, I really don't know. I don't, I'm not a big you know, uh, historian on media, so I could not tell you that. I'm sorry. Uh, at what time did advertising become uh, a revenue source for the leagues? From day one. So uh, you could pay to put your sign on the side of the wall. You could pay to put an advertisement in programs, which were sold from early on. And in fact, uh, one of the pictures I had up there earlier showed one of the first pocket schedules. Once the National League actually went to having a fixed schedule, um, you could sell pocket schedules, which not only told your team, you know, told your fans every date that you were going to be available that they could buy tickets for, but on the backside was an ad from one of your local sponsors. Mike, uh, do you uh, discount the usual argument that uh, the NL was uh, um, successful in replacing the National Association that preceded it uh, because they uh, cleaned up uh, baseball? 
professional baseball, which uh, reputedly had a lot of um, uh, dishonesty that came along with the uh, first professional uh, uh, league. Well, absolutely. There's, there's no question about that. But it wouldn't have been worth the effort if the profit potential wasn't there. So the National League certainly did that. They, they cleaned up the game, and that was one of Holbert's big mandates. In order to make this even more popular, make it more attractive, and that's where he took the page from Vaudeville. What Vaudeville did was they cleaned up the acts, you know, um, no, no, you know, scantily clad women whose ankles you could see, no questionable language, uh, you know, no, not, stuff like that was eliminated, and those were the shows that would then draw women and would increase the number of people coming. And Holbert saw the success of that. You know, Tony Pastor made a fortune doing that in vaudeville, and he, he copied that. He said, we need to do this. If we can clean this up, we can not only make this profitable, we can make it really profitable. And that's exactly what happened. So the profit potential had to be there before the effort to clean it up was worthwhile. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Okay, we'll be taking a break then for lunch. Lunch isn't quite ready yet, so you've got about five, ten minutes to clean up and visit with your neighbors and tuck away your notes and all of those kinds of things. Enjoy your break. 12.45, we'll meet back here. 12.45.
Okay, good afternoon. All right, I am pleased to um, introduce Stu Thornley uh, with our keynote address. And Stu is also a Bob Davids Sabre Award winner. He received the Macmillan Sabre Macmillan Publishing Saber Baseball Research Award for On to Nicolet, the glory and fame of the Minneapolis Millers, and his presentation on the polo grounds at the 1998 Saber National Convention was voted the convention's best. He is an official scorer at Minnesota Twins games and also a member of the Major League Baseball Official Scoring Advisory Committee. So with professional baseball in Minnesota, their early years, Please help me welcome Stu Thornley. Thank you, Sarah. Anybody have a favorite 19th century player? Who? Perry Worden. Perry Worden. Okay, I'm going to talk about him. That's great. Anybody else? Doc Adams. Doc Adams. Mike Kelly, not the Mike Kelly, the owner, but the King Kelly, Slide Kelly, Slide. Joe Hauser. Joe Hauser, okay, wrong century, but close. <laughs> I love that. Anybody ever see them play? Sid Hartman. Okay, Sid, Hart Sid Hartman. We're not going to talk about that, okay? No Sid Hartman today. And we got people from all over, but nobody from Texas, right? No Texans. Anybody here ever live in Texas? Anybody ever say things are bigger in Texas? Has anybody ever said that? <laughs> you heard it. Okay, that's close enough for me. <laughs> I really wanted somebody to do it. I love it when they brag about it because, you know, they'll say everything's bigger, including mosquitoes, but they can't top Minnesota on that. And, you know, it's not, that's not just my opinion. As somebody who was born in the 19th century said you could look it up, and when Off Mosquito Repellent did their commercials for Deep Woods Off, they came to Minnesota to do that. <laughs> and you could look that up. I, I'm kind of nostalgic for those great old Off Mosquito commercials. Do you, you remember that one where they had that big acrylic cube you could see in, and all the mosquitoes were in there, and they had an opening, and the guy stuck his arm in it, and all the mosquitoes were all over it, and he pulled it out, and he sprayed it with the Off, and he put it back in. And then the voiceover came on and said, remember, when you're surrounded by mosquitoes, you can't beat off. <laughs> so we, we are big on truth and advertising in Minnesota as well. I'm guessing I'm like most of, most of you that I could tell you what happened 100 years ago better than I could what happened 100 days ago. Uh, I grew up reading about baseball going back before the days that Abner Doubleday did not invent baseball in Elihu Finney's cow pasture in Cooperstown or in any other cow pasture or in any other Elihu Finney enterprise. And I'm sure I learned the truth about Abner Doubleday, that he was at least a fraud in that respect, uh, before I learned the truth about Santa Claus or, or supply-side economics or anything like that. Uh, and I read about baseball all the time, frustrating my teachers. I'll bet we're all alike in that. But in 1979, I joined Sabre. And first thing, I had read something in Sports Illustrated about Sabre. In fact, I think a lot of people did because Sabre had a big bump in membership that year. It might have been that Sports Illustrated article. And right away, I get two publications back from Sabre. And one is the directory, which I had more fun with. This is back in paper directory days. And I went through it with a felt tip marker in a couple different colors. One I was marking just anybody who was local. And most of the people I hadn't even met yet. Glenn Gostick was somebody, a name I recognized, but just who's around here? And within a couple of years, we were starting to get that group together. And the other one was just fun to look at people who weren't necessarily local, but people I knew or I'd heard of. And I was pretty impressed with this. Harmon Killebrew was a member at that time. Stan Musial. And back then, you would put your expertise in Stan Musial's was hitting a baseball. <laughs> Somebody else, and does anybody know the name Donald Sobel, S-O-B-O-L? I bet you read his books when you are growing up. Encyclopedia Brown? Anybody read those little minute mysteries? Mike did, yay. 
And I thought, this is kind of cool. This guy, I've read all his Minute Mysteries. He's Sabre member. And it would have been, oh, gee, 1991. I was working for a book publisher. And we were in Orlando for the International Reading Association Conference. And Florida authors or anybody within driving distance was invited to come and sign books. And he was there. And I got to go up to him. And rather than fawn over his Encyclopedia Brown books, which he gave me one free, uh, I said, wow, you're in Sabre, or at least you were, and you're a baseball fan, and he just didn't really seem to give a damn. <laughs> um, it was kind of a bummer, but he did, he did sign my book, Best Wishes, Donald Sobel, it's so heartwarming. My wife enjoys that. Nineteen, three years before that, we were, I went to pick her up for our first date. We went and saw the Naked Gun movie. And they don't make them anymore. One of those characters doesn't make movies anymore. But um, she, she wanted to be prepared for the date and knew I had a book out that year, so she bought the book. And then she gives it to me. Here, will you sign this? And what do you do on a first date for signing a book to a woman? And, God, anything, you know. I wrote, best wishes, Stu Thornley, <laughs> just like Donald Sobel. <laughs> That was in December 88. About a week later, I get a holiday card from Brenda. Best wishes, Brenda. <laughs> <laughs> so Craig, who was Craig? He, he had me sign two books today. They both say best wishes. You know, that's a really warm inscription. The other thing I got when I joined Sabre was the Baseball Research Journal, which I still put out. But I thought, wow. This is by members researching and writing things. Like, I could get published? I could see my name on something other than a typewriter, a typeset, and everything else. So, you know, I got to I gotta do that. Uh, and so I did. And after a couple of false starts, I zeroed in on something that's been talked about here today, the 1884 season here in Minneapolis as the minor leagues were getting going. Um, Dan mentioned the tri tripartite agreement of 1883 when the Northwestern League got going. And by the next year, there were three teams in Minnesota, uh, St. Paul, Minneapolis, and, and Stillwater, and later on a team in Winona because the league was real unstable and teams were coming and going. But it was what caught my attention was from the Macmillan Ency Encyclopedia that there was an 1884 team listed in the major leagues, the St. Paul team. Uh, it was more or less a pretty unremarkable story of this team finishing out its season uh, St. Paul and Milwaukee were the only two survivors of the Northwestern League, uh, still standing in September, and were asked if they would like to complete their season. And the Union Association, which was equally volatile with teams coming and going, and St. Paul played uh, seven games in it, won two, lost six, um, tied one. In fact, their first win came in a game where they didn't get any hits. It was a five-inning range-shortened game in St. Louis, and they managed to squeeze out a run and, uh, and won their first game without any hits. But that's what I wrote about that appeared in the 1980 journal. But I got sucked in with a lot of stuff because it was a significant season, and one of the people I got to, to learn about was somebody featured in the newspaper recently, Elmer Foster. Did anybody see Kurt Brown's good article in the Tribune? Anybody here learn about this symposium because of Kurt Brown? Great, and Gene Gomes had lined that up with Kurt Brown. Kurt Brown does a great thing every Sunday on some aspect of Minnesota history, and Gene said, well, we've got this symposium coming up. Can you do something? We, we supplied him with some information. He found a lot more information on Elmer Foster. I called him the quintessential Minneapolis kid, born in 1861 in Minneapolis. And according, now I'm starting to kind of doubt this too, according to a 1912 fact-challenged retrospective article on Minneapolis baseball. He was there in 1867 when Minneapolis had its first organized team playing just across uh, the river. In fact, uh, those of you who go to our chapter meetings, we meet at Faith Mennonite Church, that might have been just about on the spot where that first team played. It was the old fairgrounds before the State Fair and St. Paul Falcon Heights got going, and that encompasses that area there. And it said Elmer Foster was around in 1877 for the first salaried team. John Thorne had talked about the League Alliance. Minneapolis had a team in that. And, so, and supposedly here at 16 years old, Elmer Foster was a witness to all of this. Uh, there's another source, however, that says census information indicates that he grew up in Illinois. 
But definitely Elmer Foster was back in Minneapolis in 1883 on an amateur team that played at 31st and Nicollet Avenue, just off Lake Street. And that area is familiar because 13 years later it became the home of Nicollet Park. And Foster was around in 1884 when Minneapolis-St. Paul Stillwater got going in the Northwestern League, the first fully professional league that Minnesota had teams in. But even though he was a Minneapolis guy, he wasn't with Minneapolis. The Minneapolis ownership uh, was Tuthill from Michigan, and he had the idea that, you know, this is a big pro team. We just can't go with local talent. We've got to get out-of-town talent. And so Foster, along with some others, ended up with other teams. Joe Visner played in Stillwater. Uh, Minneapolis loss was Stillwater's gain. Bob Tholkis has researched quite a bit about uh, Joe Visner, said he was quite the uh, reprobate, which really sounds distinguished. Uh, and he, he was buried up in Faustin on, is it reservation land or something? Uh, he had a wife up there, and he would kind of come back and forth and impregnate her and leave and come back 18 times, something like that. Uh, not necessarily the, the best person. The, the, the big star for Minneapolis was Bob Carruthers, who was a two-way player. I mean, he could both pitch and play, not, not Babe Ruth style, pitch and then switch to outfield, more a Tony style, doing the same thing. Back in the 1880s, there were several players like that, uh, including um, some of uh, teammate with um, Fouts, Dave Fouts, who, like Carruthers, had been in the Northwestern League in Michigan the previous year, who ended up um, going to St. Louis uh, in the American Association after that. Uh, in 1884, Carruthers was normally just uh, a, a pitcher. He didn't really play and then go to the outfield for the Millers. He's focused more on pitching and had a pretty good season, uh, depending on 17 wins or 14 wins, depending on your source. He did have a great duel with Bud Fowler of Stillwater in which um, Carruthers had struck out, and it varies from 14 to 17. He struck out 17 batters. Fowler was prominent because he was a black player, uh, sometimes credited with being the first black player in organized baseball. And that goes back to the time when they were all black teams, and we'll be hearing the, about that from Frank White. But it was a little rare that you would have a black player on an otherwise white team. But Minnesota had already had that a bit. In 1873, it was Prince Honeycutt up in Fergus Falls. Honeycutt had been uh, a mess, um, with uh, General John Compton's army during the Civil War, went to Illinois with them, came up to Fergus Falls in the central part of the state and started a team there. And then a pitcher named Fisher, W.W. Fisher, playing on an amateur team in Winona in 1875. And a lot of controversy with that, some of it ostensibly over professionalism, as professionalism was creeping into the game there, that he was a professional recruited from the East. Uh, but there was a lot of just outright overt racism uh, that was targeted at the pitcher Fisher for Winona. Uh, and he later left the t team or left the state in a hurry. Reportedly, he got involved in a, in a he would pl uh, pitch, also play second base, in a game fixing where the Winona pitcher had been paid to lose a game and enlisted Fisher on that. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. Uh, Bud Fowler and Stillwater had his own controversy. He was suspended near the end of the 1884 season. And that was because Stillwater had a pitcher named Bradley, and Fowler refused to follow his signals. Uh, well, Bob Davids, the Sabre founder, he chimed in on that one and said he thinks that Bradley just refused to take signals from a black player. And that was the problem. And, and Bob Davids also said that same year in Toledo uh, with Fleet Walker and Tony Mullane, the same thing was happening, that Tony Mullane did not want to take signals from a black catcher. So I can imagine that too. Um, but while St. Paul was doing pretty well, both financially and in the standings, uh, and in, in part thanks to the Minneapolis exiles, there was Billy O'Brien, another good Minneapolis player who went over there. The first time Minneapolis and St. Paul met, it was Elmer Foster on the mound for St. Paul, and he shut out the Minneapolis team. Uh, Foster, later in the season, he hurt his arm, and when he was coming back, and Foster had said that he was just about to sign a contract with Cincinnati and the American Association 
and he threw a pitch and snapped his arm, and that kind of finished him off. He tried to make it with Philadelphia in the National League the following year, but couldn't make it. Um, Charlie Ganzel, uh, who established himself a bit in Minneapolis, also married a Minneapolis woman. Uh, he was good friends with Elmer Foster, and Charlie Ganzel made it with Philadelphia. Ganzel was considered one of the first family of baseball from Michigan, uh, born in Wisconsin, but uh, raised in Michigan with a lot of brothers who played ball. And Ganzel had a lot of kids, too, one of whom was a really good ball player. Babe Ganzel played with the Minneapolis Millers in the 1930s, managed the St. Paul Saints. Babe's real name was Foster. Charlie Ganzel had named his son after his good friend, Elmer Foster. Foster did end up finally playing for Minneapolis in 1887, in part because his brother owned the team at that time. And he had a very good season. His batting average was 415. And a few years later, he was with Chicago, with Poppy Anson, Chicago White Stockings, or Colts, whatever they were called at that time. And he had five home runs in 1890, which is good, even better considering that he did it within a month. He didn't join the team until the final month of the season. And he started the 1891 season with them. Uh, he, he, when he died, uh, Kurt Braun mentioned this in Elmer Foster's obituary in 1946. Uh, local writers were saying that he was the Ty Cobb of the 1890s. And uh, I don't know if Ty Cobb was ever called the Elmer Foster of the 19th century or anything like that. <laughs> and there was also a story in, in his obituary that goes back to a book first published in 1910. This is a reprint of it from about 1998. Al, Al Spink, who founded the Sporting News, in 1910-11 wrote a book. And it had a great story in there about Elmer Foster that one time with the game on the line and the bases loaded and the bottom of the ninth, the, when he was playing for Chicago, he dived for a fly ball. If he catches it, the game's over. But he missed the ball, but he caught a bird. <laughs> and, you know, right off the bat, it's kind of, you know, uh, really? Uh, and then, you know, look up the details of it. And, okay, none of the details match anything. And I, I also realize sometimes maybe there's some reality to the essence of his story, it's just the details are off. It wasn't hard going through every game he played for Chicago in 1890, 1891, because he didn't play that many games. You know, like nothing like that happened. So Kurt Brown had this, but with a little disclaimer from me that, you know, I was thoroughly skeptical of it. And, <laughs> and you know, it just, it brings up a good question for all of us as researchers. You know, it's just like if, the story's not real. You can't, you can't go with it, or you have to indicate skepticism or something. You know, Mike, Mike Vec, I've done a book on the saints, and I've had to let him know, you know, these stories that you tell and these stories that your dad told, you know, I can't print that way without indicating that they're really a load of crap. <laughs> and maybe, maybe I was, you know, with Mike Vec, you don't really have to be that much more diplomatic, because he just, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. <laughs> He's not shy that he embellishes stuff. They've got the story of the mines. Mike even has this in his book. It's one thing I just heard him speak recently. Everybody loved him. You know, oh, yeah, they're good stories. Uh, but in his book, Fun is Good, and this is a legend among the Saints employees that they've heard from when they had mime night, when the Saints first got going in 1993. And uh, great, great idea for this. They didn't have a video scoreboard, so they brought out mimes who were then going to do instant replays with people. Hell of an idea. <laughs> But they don't go over good. That's what Mike Beck says. You know, it's, it's weird that mimes can be perfectly safe on the streets of New York and they're endangered here. Minnesotans hate mimes. <laughs> well, I, I guess for sure it didn't go over as a good promotion, but I think it got embellished, and Beck had it in his book, uh, that people were throwing hot dogs at the mimes. <laughs> they were going to the uh, concession stand and buying more and more hot dogs just so they could throw it at the mimes. And the way the story gets told by employees is that the mimes finally left, still miming, but <laughs> duels up there, or that they were getting out of character and saying things that included F-bombs. Now, and Vex says in his book, this was like the front page stuff of Minneapolis and St. Paul newspapers the next day. I went back, you yeah, know, there's a picture there of a mime talking to people or entertaining people in the parking lot. Uh, the kicker of it all was that there was another little item, and the Saints were less than a week old. They took over this tiny little Midway Stadium and with a really cramped concession area that couldn't, 
couldn't meet the demand, including, and it mentioned hot dogs. They can't make enough hot dogs for people to eat, let alone throw at people. So, well, what do you do with that? I, are we being too picky? That's the question. Dan Levitt and I, about 10 years ago, spoke down in uh, at St. Olaf College, where Tom Swift, one of our members, was. And somebody there asked me, is it always a good thing to destroy a legend? You know, it kind of got me thinking. I, you know, I, and, you know, I mean, it's Liberty Valance, when the legend becomes fact, print the legend, all of that. And I've, I've thought about that, really, for 10 years. Uh, well, if I'm putting in print, at least I want to not just put stuff that I know is false without clarifying it or something like that. But I got to thinking about it. Well, after reading that story about Elmer Foster and the bird, I got the reprint of the book. And that's on something like page 396. On page 395 is a story about Frank Isbell. Isbell was a first baseman for the Chicago White Sox in the 1900s. And he goes back when the team went back to St. Paul. He was a sometimes pitcher, sometimes first baseman there. And it was like, gee, this is even more bizarre than the bird story that he's saying on Sunday games and played in some tiny little park. I have no idea which one had these high walls. The whole story was nonsensical because it looked like we won because somebody hit a ball that was going to be off the high fence. I don't know, how do you win the game on that? But there was a nail sticking out of the fence and the ball stuck right into the nail. <laughs> and before we could get a stepladder out and get that ball, the runners and the batter had circled the bases and we lost. And I thought, okay, I have no problem calling BS on that one. So <laughs> now nah, nah, you took it too far. You know, Elmer Foster ended up in Chicago in 1890 for that final month, about three or four games in 1891 when he got bumped out of there by Anson for drinking. Uh, and this is also about the time his, when he came back, he, well, he played the rest of the season with Kansas City and the Western Association. But his, his mom had died too, and he was pretty wealthy from that. But he's, he hung around, he was a frequent visitor at games, and uh, he, so he still kind of fit that quintessential Minneapolis kid sort of thing. But reading some of the other stuff, maybe he rivaled uh, Joe Visner as a reprobate. Not always the nicest guy, assault, assault people, uh, things like that. Sometimes maybe I don't want to learn that much more about a person. But the reason he went to Chicago was that in 1890, when Minneapolis was in the heart of its first pennant race, he and the second baseman, Moxie Hengel, left the team on a dispute with management. It wasn't Foster's brother managing anymore. They just left. But this team was pretty good. And it had a manager, Tim Hurst, for a while. Tim Hurst made his name as an umpire. He was also a boxing referee. He was an umpire with really pugilistic insult, impulses, which is also what probably shortened his umpiring career. And uh, a Sunday in Milwaukee, Minneapolis is playing, and Tim Hurst is the umpire, and he got tired of Milwaukee's arguing, and he declared a forfeit victory for Minneapolis, and Hurst left the field. Minneapolis hung around because they were told, you're not going to get your fee if, if you leave, so they played out the game and lost, and eventually after the season it was ruled a Minneapolis forfeit victory. The teams, both teams were back in Minneapolis to play the next day, and Tim Hurst was scheduled to be the umpire, but he wasn't because he was now the Minneapolis manager. And I thought, boy, that's kind of weird. <laughs> There's already been rumors about him, and, and the Minneapolis papers are saying those umpires don't get any pay. Maybe Dan disproved that, more of an excuse. But how do you forfeit a game to one team and then end up as their manager the next day? And I'm reading Minneapolis papers, so I'm not getting anything that's really pointing out how outrageous this is. I, I never have, I haven't looked it up in a Milwaukee paper to see a different point of view. Sporting News didn't really have anything on it. But he started managing the team. And he had a star pitcher named Martin Duke. And Martin Duke, earlier in the season by Baron Hawk, one of the co-owners, High Hawk, uh, had been uh, suspended for two weeks for not being in condition. And that doesn't mean he wasn't running his wind sprints. You know, we all know what in the 1890s, not in condition meant you were drunk. And he got suspended for that. You know, that's just the codes that we all know from kind of like yeah, the vapors. Have any ever, you know, I grew up, I always heard from way back when, I had the vapors, you know, and 
oh wow gee and then I somebody said no that's just gas you know it's okay <laughs> I suppose not being in condition and having the vapors kind of go together I know it <laughs> does for me but when Tim Hurst took over as manager he took Martin Duke to a priest and got him to make a vow of abstinence which apparently he stuck to because he was really good and Minneapolis is in the pennant race and in September Duke strikes out 18 batters against Denver and then they go to Kansas City they're in a virtual tie with Kansas City starting a three-game series Duke was on the mound and the Kansas City fans were ready because there was a rumor that Duke's real name was Duck so they showed up with noisemakers of any kind but particularly duck calls and supposedly somebody threw a live duck onto the field during this time too and whether, whether that rattled him, uh, whether he wasn't in condition, <laughs> whether he had the vapors, whatever, to use a technical term, Duke shit the bed that day. And, yet, and w the irony of it all is that Tim Hurst came to take him out and wanted to replace him with a pitcher named Mitchell, and the umpire said, no, Mitchell's not on your substitution list. He said, I don't care, I want to put Mitchell in. No, you can't do it and Hearst pulled his team off the field and it was a forfeit victory for Kansas City. I just thought it was kind of <laughs> ironic considering how things had started with, with Hearst coming to the team. Minneapolis lost the next two games and they lost, they didn't, they didn't win the pennant. But they were kind of back in at the following year. That's that 1891 season that Dan was talking about and I didn't realize the financial instability of, of these teams but in the American Association its last season the Cincinnati team folded so Milwaukee and the Western Association was invited to take their spot and assume their record and when they left the Western Association the Minneapolis Millers were in first place wow they're back in a pennant race that was in August and they played one more game and then they disbanded so the first place didn't last too long um, and it could be what you said Dan it was a lot of financial instability but Peter Morris, a former Sabre, a great historian researcher, um, he had said that his research, and he thought the disbandment was kind of mysterious, even though this was happening with other teams, but he said it went back to the management of the team. Baron Hawk, Sam Morton, and Fred Glade, who jointly owned the team, and they also owned other businesses, including a sporting good business, and they had a falling out in the other non-baseball businesses, which caused the demise of the team. So that ended that pennant race. Uh, the Twin Cities were without baseball for a little bit, but then, and it's been talked about, John Thorne talked about that 1894 Western League that got going. Ban Johnson with aspirations of turning it into a major league, which he eventually did. In 1895, his then friend Charles Comiskey uh, got a, a, a disbanded franchise in Sioux City and put it into St. Paul. He played a few games for them too, Comiskey. He had a small ballpark, uh, kind of close to the city, off Dale Street, which is about a mile from downtown, tiny little ballpark. And Comiskey and all played there for a few years, and that's when the team, the St. Paul team, moved to Chicago after the 1899 season. And I look forward to hearing more about what Dan talked about with all the machinations that made that possible. But obviously, as part of the grander plan, they become a major league. Uh, so St. Paul was gone. They still exist as the White Sox. In 1900, when the Western League took the name American League, but it was still a minor league, Minneapolis still had a team in it. But at the end of that season, when the big move to be a major league took place, most of the cities were left behind. Minneapolis just disbanded and was replaced by one of the teams uh, out, out, out east. Uh, and that's... Uh, so no Major League Baseball in there for Minneapolis or St. Paul, even though Minneapolis did have a team in the American League in 1900. I mentioned the, the little ballpark that the Saints played in from 1895 and 1896. Uh, it was a small ballpark, but one of the things they couldn't do was play on Sunday, and that was a big issue back at that time. Uh, it was more of a neighborhood thing. There was a state statute that prohibited Sabbath breaking. Uh, so you're not supposed to do anything fun on Sunday as this to matter was baseball fun. And really it came down just to local neighborhoods and how much opposition there would be. And there was a lot of opposition 
where Comiskey was. So they had to play elsewhere. At times they played uh, at, at a horse track in Minneapolis where the Minneapolis team was also playing on Sundays. They also went back to the west side of St. Paul. The west side of St. Paul is actually south of downtown. It's just that the river goes through and it's the west bank of the Mississippi. And there were two ballparks there. The longer lasting, the better known of the two um, it was called Athletic Park on State Street. And they played their Sunday games there. They had played there regularly in the 1880s. It was often underwater. These west side flats got flooded all the time. And the only picture I've ever seen of this ballpark is underwater. But the interesting part of it is uh, Paul Clifford Larson, an architectural historian about 15 years ago, discovered the construction permit for the thing that said it was the firm of Knox and Gilbert. And Gilbert was Cass Gilbert, noted architect. Woolworth Building in New York, Supreme Court Building in Washington, and a few years after that, uh, the, the current Minnesota Capitol. And uh, so just interesting. I, well, to me, I just I looked at this and a few people, boards thrown together and <laughs> they needed an architect, you know. My, <laughs> but yeah, they did. Exactly how active he was in there uh, with that, uh, Paul Clifford Larson said he doesn't know, but it was still an interesting part of it. But Comiskey more solved the Sunday problem by getting a new ballpark a mile to the west of his current one on Lexington and University. It opened in 1897, Lexington Park. It was far enough out of the city that nobody really cared that you were playing Sunday games there. But the fact that it was was also kind of the downfall of it at that time. That's a long ways out. It's not like the city just kind of expanded out to that point. And meanwhile, Minneapolis had played. We saw the athletic park that they played in from 1889 to 1896, which was downtown. Uh, right across the street from where Target Center is, a block from the Twins' current ballpark, this tiny little bandbox that allowed Perry Worden, whose favorite player was Perry Worden? Okay, how are you rich? Okay. Yeah, he had 42 home runs there one year, 45 the next. Major League record till, or a professional record till Babe Ruth took up the business of hitting home runs, a minor league record until Moses Solomon broke it in the 1920s. And from what I can see, the fences were about 250 feet down the line. But they had gotten evicted from that spot and went on a three-week road trip, which was plenty of time to put up a new ballpark. And it went back. <laughs> That's the way they did it back then. Uh, they, they got to Nicollet Park back on Nicollet and Lake, where the team had played in 1883. And I, it, it, I'm sticking to the 19th century, so I'm not going to get too much into it. Kristen Anderson has done so much on this. On, on Nicollet was fortunate enough to not burn down until they rebuilt it in steel and concrete in 1912. But that's what then served the Millers through 1955. And meanwhile, Lexington Park in St. Paul um, served the Saints mostly from 1897 to 1956. They did go from 1903 to 1909 to a small ballpark in downtown St. Paul called the Downtown Ballpark, otherwise known as the Pillbox, tiny little dimensions, and it was it was a good place uh, for people to get to. Same thing, though. They were so close to the churches and all that the Sunday ball, they did play one Sunday game there, but they'd have to go elsewhere with it. And finally, in 1909, that Sabbath-breaking law was lifted, and they were able to, um, they could play on Sunday, and by that time, they just went back to Lexington Park regularly. The Sunday baseball, other than teams being prevented from playing Sunday baseball, and looking elsewhere, they never had any of the incidents that they were having in some other places. In fact, that day in Milwaukee that Tim Hurst forfeit the game to Minneapolis, in Des Moines, St. Paul and the Des Moines team were being arrested because it was a Sunday. And it was one of those things, the cops show up after the first inning, they arrest everybody. Uh, supposedly they set bail, I don't, I don't know if they really did, and they said, okay, go along and complete your game come in tomorrow and we don't have a hearing. Uh, in some places in 1889 it was happening a lot. Perry Worden stole second base and got arrested. <coughs> <laughs> not, not for stealing second, but for doing it on a Sunday. Uh, but the same thing, uh, sometimes they would ask the people, do you want the game to continue? And some of these things, the arrests, were more set up by the teams as a way of challenging some of those local blue laws. I think that same year, 1899, 
The Millers got arrested in, at River Rouge Park in Ecorse, Michigan. It was outside Detroit. They, still, it wasn't allowed. And I found an item from Minneapolis Daily, the University of Minnesota newspaper, because the, the U of M played a game in Dubuque on a Sunday, the student manager had his diploma held up by the university. I guess he was the one who was, who was blamed for, for all of that. So he had his diploma held up. And well, finally, you know, it took even longer in New York, not till what, 1917, 18, 19, that they could play. So we were a little bit more advanced here. I'm gonna open it up for questions for whatever time we have left, but I'm going to just read something that's true about Elmer Foster. And this is thanks to Gene Gomes, who found this in the May, eight, May 11th, 1890 St. Paul Globe. And it was about crime in Minneapolis. If you open today's paper, you're probably reading about crime in Minneapolis. It's, it's rampant, but boy, we don't know how good we had it compared to this bad stuff that was going on in 1890. The paper reported that midway through May, or a third of the way through it, there had been two arrests in Minneapolis. One was of a man without hands or feet who was sentenced to the workhouse at hard labor for 90 days on the charge of vagrancy. And I thought, what do I even start asking questions about that one? <laughs> but the other one was a boy who picked up a baseball which Foster batted over the fence at Athletic Park. So Foster, I guess, did contribute to the delinquency of minors. He, like I said, he was a, he was a reprobate. <laughs> Just open up the questions now for whatever time we have left. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Did you ever go after a story where you were pretty sure it was just going to be so bogus and it was even better than you thought for real? Yeah, a story that's so bogus that there's a lot of them. Um, you know what's fun though is when you can find out what drove that bogus story. That's, that's the real fun of Abner Doubleday myth, the other Abner Graves, crazy man who said that he did it. There was a story that was in a book by a guy named Mac Davis called Sports Shorts about an early century game in western Minnesota where you know, a man was running home to score the winning run and he collapsed and his teammate picked him up and hoisted him on the shoulders and stepped on the plate himself and dropped the player on the plate and the dead man had scored the winning run, which is obviously incorrect because he would have been called out for having been passed by another runner. Uh, <laughs> But on that one, the Candy O.I. County Historical Society kind of had the backstory on it that some, somebody passing through a telegraph, somebody as a prank sent it out in the telegraphs, and it got picked up and eventually put into a book. You know, it's worth mentioning these things. The big Minneapolis Miller's story that gets unfortunately told is real about Andy Euler hitting a two-foot home run into the mud in front of home plate at Nicollet Park and circling the bases before they could find the ball. And you know, and the thing is, Euler hit, I mean, this is a fact, he hit one home run and all his years were the Millers and it was at Milwaukee, it didn't resemble that. And the sa same thing, I mean, could something like that have happened? Could he have gotten a double? Um, but you know, when I was researching the Millers game by game, I knew that story and I was looking every time to see and there was, nothing like it. Rich Arpey came up with something from the Iron Range on, um, it was a Heine Berger who did that, where it's, it was doc, if I see it documented in the newspaper of that day, I'll put a little more trust in it than I, but even that Andy Euler story, I think I talked to a friend of Andy Euler's grandson who grew up in Pennsylvania where Andy Euler was and said, oh yeah, that old guy would come and tell us how he hit that, so how it got started, I don't know. Sometimes it's still worth telling just Kind of have to point out the skepticism with him. Rich?
And I know. Okay. Well, that's possible, although I'm guessing Andy Euler might have been telling that, too. John, John Abel? Uh, continuing this vein, when we were editing the film, the baseball film by Ken Burns that first aired on PBS in 1994, um, we would come across some narrator in, in a film clip stating something that was obviously to some of us, not true. And I would raise my hand and say, uh, we, we ought to uh, perhaps check this fact before we consider putting it into the film. At which point, everyone in the room would simultaneously yell, that fact is too good to check. <laughs> I know, oh yeah. And that goes back to that question from 10 years ago, is it okay to destroy legends? Um, I guess I, I still, if nothing else, I wrote a book on Halsey Hall who was full of stories and there was a few facts too good to check, but I just say, here's a, here's a story, you know, and, and according to Halsey, and I, I hope that that indicated a little skepticism in it. Eric. Yeah, so. Easiest job in the world, except when it's not. I love it, except when I don't. Uh, some nights you can just sit there and keep score of a game like I did when I was a kid and like we all have and have nothing to do. And then every so often you just get one of those plays that's going to ruin your night. And it's, I think it's gotten better. We've been meeting as official scorers for, since 2012, which has helped us, I believe, to standardize our calls. I've even done a little analytics on it followed up on a study that Craig Wright did in 1988 to show inconsistency among scores in various cities, and I replicated the study to show I think we're get, getting better. Um, I think it's gotten better. For one thing, players have the right to submit to Major League Baseball a scoring decision for appeal. And so once in a while we get, and it's Joe Torrey, and I can't think of anybody better that I'd rather have making the final ruling on it, uh, even though a couple times I've had something overturned and I said, I don't really understand why. But that has reduced the stress in the press box. It was the communications people, the PR people, who still are, are the ones charged with coming over to you and conveying the displeasure of a player or they get a call from the dugout or something like that. They didn't really like that. They'd get caught in the middle. And now they can just say, well, if the player doesn't like it, he can send it in. So uh, we still get arguments. You know, it's... That's a part of the job is that you have to just deal with the stress. No different than an umpire. You might have the best umpire in the world and calling balls and strikes or, you know, but if you, you're, you're going to be putting up with stuff and you've got to be able to deal with it. I love it, though. Tonight I do basketball official scoring, uh, and I'm just doing points, rebounds, timeouts, nothing even controversial like is that a rebound or an assist or anything like that. It's just that you better make sure the score is always correct, and a couple times I haven't had it correct. One time we didn't know if the score was 96-92 or 94-92, and that, that'll get you into trouble too. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, view on the interference call. Um, I think it's a bad rule. Um, but I think the umpire ought to call it. Of course, it was the same kind of thing in 1969, right, when J.C. Martin got hit by Pete Rickard's throw when it wasn't called. Uh, to me, I don't know why you try to protect a pitcher or a catcher making a throw to first. You don't do the same thing when there's a runner on first going to second, and that first baseman has, he's, he has to throw around him. And the whole thing is, is that a right-handed batter is never going to get on that right side until he gets to the base. Um, we've heard talk that maybe they will go to that double base. I'm, they, they might maybe think that'll make us look too much like a beer league softball team or something like that. And as we always know, baseball is very proactive all the time. 
<laughs> they wait till something hits the fan and then they do something about it. Um, but if you take this back to official scoring, you know, one thing I like about that rule, this is completely unrelated, because you have to be in the three foot box starting 45 feet down, there's that second line that comes down and it clearly marks the halfway point between the plate and first base. And the reason I like it is every time there's a ground ball, especially left side of the infield, I'm looking at how far down the baseline that runner is. If the ball gets bobbled, maybe I'm going to call it a hit anyway because I think he would be, and that's a nice benchmark. So if they do change the rule, which I think they ought to just take that rule away, uh, you know, there goes a little the visual point for us. But I, I supported the umpires on it. Sam Holbrook, he ought to make the call, and, and he did. And, well, Washington ended. Probably might have hurt, uh, who'd they beat? Um, Houston. <laughs> Uh, that long delay in there might have might have hurt their pitcher a little bit more. I don't know. I think. about that. Oh, I have to be by this, don't I? I'm just getting this set up here. Excuse me. So now we're moving on to the interdisciplinary portion of this meeting, and I, I'm getting into the spirit of the 19th century here. I know what I'd be doing if I was alive back then. So, um, but our next speaker is Larry Millett, and um, you can read in your programs that he is the author of many books about architecture, and um, I just want to say, in addition to that and the Lost Twin Cities, um, he is also responsible for not losing many buildings that have been important to the Twin Cities. And I'm really looking forward to hearing him speak today. I am a big fan of his Sherlock Holmes mysteries that maybe some of you have heard about. My favorite one I had to bring up here to show you, this little, it's a, what he calls a chapter book. I call it an art book because it's from the Minnesota Center for Books, Book Arts. And it, it has one of his a favorite character that is much, well, a favorite character of St. Paul. Rafferty is his name. And this is his creation. And um, I, I just think it's, it's a wonderful setting, any of his Sherlock Holmes books. Um, just take you right back to the 19th century in St. Paul. And they are great fun and highly entertaining. So I would like you all to give a very warm welcome to Larry Millett and the booming 1880s, the Twin Cities Comes of Age. You got uh, it from here? I, I got it right here, I think. I'm just going to take this out before I forget it. Um, well, thank you all. Um, I am going to be talking about uh, the roaring 1880s in St. Paul, Minneapolis. I regretfully will, will probably not offer you too many facts that are too good to check, but I'll, <laughs> I'll, <laughs> I'll do my best uh, to uh, avoid too much apocrypha, but I'll have a little fun. Um, I've, been I've listened to a couple of the speeches this afternoon, and, and we talk a lot about the 1880s and um, 
what happened. And um, what I'm going to show you is how, in that particular time period, 1880, 1890, Minneapolis and St. Paul were probably the third, second and third fastest growing cities in the United States. They had an enormous boom here that only Chicago maybe equaled. And there are lots of reasons for that having to do with settlement patterns and the growth of the flour milling industry, et cetera, et cetera. But in 1880, these were pretty small provincial cities. By 1890, they were among, uh, combined among the largest of American cities. It all happened in this phenomenal 10-year growth span, the likes of which has not occurred um, since then. I'm just hoping to get this uh, to open up here. There we go. Um, and let me uh, get to the right spot here, and we will um, get going. So uh, what I want to do is um, show you uh, kind of how these cities uh, just almost overnight exploded. One, one critic at the time said Minneapolis was like an exhalation. It was just like all of a sudden the city just bloomed right before your eyes at, at warp speed, and that happened in, in both cities. Um, so uh, Twin Cities by the numbers, 1880-1890. Minneapolis population was 47,000 in 1880. The city encompassed 12.5 square miles, basically the area around downtown. By 1890, it was 165,000 people. That's basically a tr more than a tripling of population, and it was 50 square miles. It was almost the size it is today. St. Paul, 41,000 people, about 20 square miles. By the end of the decade, 133,000 people, another tripling, uh, and 56 square miles. Basically, it was the city that it is today in terms of its um, area. All that happened in this phenomenal 10-year span of growth. And if we look at what Minneapolis looked like before the 1880s, here are a couple of pictures uh, looking across the Mississippi River uh, and across uh, Nicollet Island, which is just down Hennepin here, about three blocks. If you were to walk down Hennepin to the river, you would cross over the, the present suspension bridge onto Nicollet Island. And you can see it's a pretty um, low-slung city. Uh, not a lot of tall buildings. The, the biggest concentration of buildings was along the riverfront at St. Anthony Falls, where the milling industry was already uh, a really huge business. But kind of a three-story type of city. And the same was true uh, of St. Paul. Uh, this is a view from the east side of St. Paul, uh, what's called the Dayton's Bluff neighborhood. And what you see in views of American cities, at least Western American cities from this period, is that the tallest things on the skyline, as you might imagine, are church steeples rather than office buildings. Uh, skyscrapers were non-existent before 1880 in the Twin Cities. They were just starting in places like New York uh, and, to a lesser extent, Chicago. Um, elevators didn't exist for the most part. And because elevators didn't exist, you didn't build buildings much higher than three stories because nobody, you couldn't rent the fourth floor. Nobody would walk up that high. Um, all that changed very dramatically and very swiftly in the 1880s in Minneapolis and St. Paul and other cities. But, but here the, the changes were especially rapid um, uh, all around. Um, if you walk down, if you got out the library today and walked down to the river, you'd, you'd be walking through the old grounds of what, is called, what was called um, Bridge Square, which is where Hennepin and Nicollet Avenues once came together. Now there's, they don't come together anymore because of changes over time. But that's where the first Minneapolis City Hall was. And at four stories, that was probably as tall as any building, any major building in the city at that time. Um, a, a conspicuously unhandsome building in my estimation, but um, <laughs> it was, uh, had the tall hat, the tricorn hat, looked like Napoleon. Uh, um, uh, you can see, by the way, uh, tracks there. Um, there were no streetcars in 1875, but both Minneapolis and St. Paul had horse car systems, which would have contributed mightily to the sheer amount of manure in the streets, which was one of the great problems of 19th century cities that the electric streetcar essentially solved by getting horses, uh, a lot of horses, off the streets. But that didn't happen until the end of the decade. Um, if you look at St. Uh, oops, hold on here. i got to go back one. Um, oh, no, yeah, I'm good. Um, this was the, uh, the first state capital uh, in St. Paul um, around 1875. And again, you look at that building and you say, man, that is really not very impressive. Um, <laughs> had that funny little dome that was out of scale. And it was essentially like a, an old two-story school building. You know, It was very small scale. Um, and that reflected the size of the cities um, where they were at that time. 
and all of this would, uh, as I said, change very quickly uh, in the 1880s and then on past that. Um, if you were going on our little Hennepin Avenue or Nicollet Avenue cruise again, walking down the river and you had done that in 1878, these are the kind of buildings you would have passed. Almost all built of local materials because materials from other parts of the country weren't readily available. You couldn't just get brick from St. Louis or New York. You couldn't get granite from New Hampshire because the railroad systems weren't good enough to bring a lot of that stuff in. So most buildings were built of the local limestone, which is right underneath us here, a uh, big layer of it, and that's what formed St. Anthony Falls, locally made brick, and there were really very few architects of any accomplishment who were working in the cities at that time. Basically, you hired a master builder, which is a guy who started out building things and then started doing design work later on. We call it design build today, and that's how most buildings got built. And also notice how narrow the buildings are. 25-foot lots were typical of downtown buildings at that period. Um, all the buildings of this type, virtually all of them in downtown Minneapolis, with a couple little exceptions, are gone. Uh, they're just long, long gone. Um, everything's gotten much bigger. Same thing in St. Paul, uh, except uh, St. Paul even had a more constricted, uh, blocked-in feel in Minneapolis because A, its downtown was smaller, much more compact, and B, the streets in St. Paul were 60 feet wide at best in downtown St. Paul. Every downtown street in Minneapolis was at least 80. And that had a lot to do with how the character of the two cities was different. You get this feel in St. Paul, and you still do in parts of St. Paul. St. Paul has spent a fortune widening its streets over many years, starting from that very narrow uh, start. And uh, this is Third Street here on the left, which is now Kellogg Boulevard, which was kind of the main drag through St. Paul in the 1870s. Wabasha Street, the main sort of north-south street through downtown. Here again, three-story buildings, brick, stone, very basic kind of a stuff. What you would find today if you went down and traveled 50 miles south of here, say down to the little town of Red Wing, Minnesota, and you went down their old historic main street uh, on the river, you'd see a lot of buildings just like this that still, that still stand in, in smaller towns. And these, of course, are now, uh, are, have all vanished from the Twin Cities. Um, the one area where Minneapolis, St. Paul was already a world-class enterprise was at the flour milling uh, center at St. Anthony Falls, which is just down over here a ways on the river, down toward Portland Avenue South. There was already a colossal milling district here in 1880, uh, and you can see here in this uh, picture on the left, the mills lined up uh, along the power canal that brought water in from the top of the falls and then dropped it through huge wheel pits. This was very probably, most people think, the largest direct drive industrial water-powered complex in human history. There were 25 mills operating, operating off the falls, which uh, had a total fall of about 70 feet through the, 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 the district. The only waterfall of any consequence on the Mississippi River. Great pineries to the north, great wheat growing areas to the plains to the east. It was perfectly positioned to attract saw milling, flour milling, but the flour millers eventually took over uh, they had tremendous amounts of um, expertise in what they were doing. A lot of the, the techniques that were developed here became uh, central to mechanizing the entire process of making flour. And these mills were, were huge uh, mechanical operations, all powered. The whole mill would be powered by a, a single one or two turbines sitting on those wheel pits, creating an immense amount of torque that turned. By the way, Minneapolis was also one of the leading manufacturers of artificial limbs in the 19th and early 20th century. <laughs> Want to guess why that was? <laughs> you get a hand in one of those pieces of moving machinery, it's gone. Uh, and there were uh, actually very large companies here that uh, specialized in making hands, arms, legs, whatever happened to get caught <laughs> in, the, in the milling machinery. Uh, those were the days. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Um, here's a picture of the Washburn A mill, uh, the, which was the largest mill uh, in the city in 1875. And you can see the, they, they actually made, uh, they didn't use the old millstones. Those were long gone. They used porcelain rollers. The highly mechanized process, the flour came in at the top, and by the time it got down to the bottom, it had been milled and divided into various grades and different things, put into enormous bags. A mill like this could churn out um, close to a million pounds of flour a day. That's how huge they were. Uh, and Minneapolis by 1880 was basically the world's leading flour milling city by far. No one was even close, and it held that title for the next um, 40 years, which is why in headlines in the St. Paul paper, for which I worked for many years, 
You never said Minneapolis man killed an accident. It was Mill City man dies, because Mill City was a lot, a lot easier to get into a one-column headline than, than, <laughs> than Minneapolis. <laughs> I, I remember, I, well, I actually, I went to work at the Pioneer Press, and I, like in, you know, I was just like a 24-year-old kid, didn't know anything. I run across this, and I said to some guy in the newsroom, where, where is this Mill City? You know, I was like, <laughs> and I grew up in Minneapolis. And I was like, I, 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 know, I, I had not heard that before, but um, I learned very quickly that um, <laughs> Mill City men are, are in danger. Um, 1878, the Washburn A Mill was destroyed by a gigantic explosion. Uh, it was a, a very significant case because it sort of established that A, flower dust was very volatile, and B, that it needed a spark to explode. And there had been a big dispute with the insurance companies about whether or not they would pay for the results, because they had fire insurance, but not, and, and eventually a court ruled that yes, it was a fire because it needed that spark to set that uh, flower dust, poom. And um, uh, uh, they rebuilt the mill very quickly, and by 1880, it was uh, the, the largest mill in the world, although well, it would soon be eclipsed. Today, this was the basis of the Mill City Museum over by the river in Minneapolis. And if you haven't been over there, it's a great spot to visit. Very interesting and uh, great views of St. Anthony Falls and that whole area. Um, St. Paul uh, was a much different city. St. Paul's economy was not so much based on milling, although there were mills. It was based on railroading in particular. St. Paul was a huge railroad city. It was kind of the main link to the northwest through Chicago and all out um, to the west. Uh, there was some milling here. This is Sweet Hollow on the east side of St. Paul, uh, a small valley that's still there, now a park, and there's actually a little flour mill there. You can see the little uh, dam. But behind that is one of St. Paul's other big businesses. It was for many years brewing, and that was the Ham's Brewery, which is, the, the building is still there, but uh, many of you probably in your day have knocked back a Ham's or two, uh, my dad's favorite beer, um, and uh, from the land of sky blue waters, the beer refreshing. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that was, uh, for a time uh, at its peak, that was the fifth largest brewery in the United States. Uh, it was a very big brewery complex. It's still there, but it's empty and run, mostly empty, used for other things. Um, but um, brewing was a big part of, of the 19th century economy in St. Paul because St. Paul, unlike Minneapolis, had a lot of Germans and Irish. And they liked their alcohol for some reason. So anyway. Um, if you had gone to Minneapolis, downtown Minneapolis in the 1870s, the one thing you would notice, not so much in this area, but just a few blocks to the south, there are houses everywhere. Most of downtown, was downtown Minneapolis today was at one time covered by houses, including a great many mansions, probably as many as 75 to 100, all of which, with one or two exceptions, are gone. But in the 1870s, this is the kind, this would have been a big house. These, this is along 7th Street, uh, about oh, a mile from here or less, 3rd Avenue South. Notice the wooden sidewalks, by the way. Um, this would have been the, the type of mansion you would see, these big French Second Empire, Italianate-style mansions. If you had a 5,000-square-foot house in Minneapolis or St. Paul in 1880, you were living in a mansion, without a doubt. And there weren't too many that were of that size. We will see, by the end of the, the decade, people had built 36,000-square-foot houses. And, and that just reflected the enormous uh, growth of the cities, the enormous growth of wealth for um, at least a certain part of the population. Um, here's a, um, a, an example of some of the downtown Mini Minneapolis mansions built in the 1860s and 70s. I doubt any of these are much more than 5,000 square feet. They're kind of big square, eh, not always very attractive houses, but um, very typical of what you would see across the United States um, at that time. Uh, but here's an interesting thing. I think I'll switch here. Um, this, is what, this is kind of in two slides, tells you what happens in the Twin Cities in the 1880s. On the left is James J. Hill's first house, first mansion in St. Paul, built in 1877 in what was called Lower Town, just east of the downtown area. One of those French Second Empire mansions with a mansard roof, probably maybe 5,000 square feet, maybe four. That was 1877. By 1891, he was getting ready. He, of course, had become the tycoon of tycoons in the Twin Cities. The Great Northern Railway was just about to be formed, but he had already developed a great railroad system. He built his mansion, his second house, about a mile away up on the hill, Summit Avenue in St. Paul. That's the 36,000 square footer. Still the largest house ever built in Minneapolis or St. Paul. Not on Lake Minnetonka, however. But that's a... Uh, <laughs> Another story. 
Um, <laughs> but uh, an enormous house and, and, and springing from the enormous wealth that the, the business barons and um, uh, mucky mucks and moguls uh, uh, made in the Twin Cities in the 18th. There was a lot of money to be made in lumber, in milling, in railroading. Uh, this was new land and it was just being opened up and the, the opportunities to make enormous fortunes was very visible here. Uh, Minneapolis by 1890 supposedly had 38 millionaires. Although every city that I've ever read about there's a book somewhere that says, did you know that by 1890 we had 45 millionaires? And like, oh, okay, how do you know that? Well, <laughs> we're, in, we're into some of Stu's apocrypha here maybe, but obviously a lot of very rich, uh, rich people by the end of the decade. Uh, when the 1880s started, a, a million dollar fortune would have been, I think, pretty rare here. But not everybody had a million dollars. And if you didn't, if you were one of the working poor, one of the new immigrants, of which there were a great many poured in here, um, uh, Minneapolis had 200 Johnsons in the 1880 directory, 200 people named Johnson. By 1890, they had 2,000. And that just tells you a lot of whom were, were Scandinavian immigrants, not all, but a lot of them. But that tells you how much things had changed. This is Bohemian Flats on the left, and on the right is the Upper Levy Flats in St. Paul. And this is where the very poor people lived. People, somebody owned this land, which was considered worthless because it was flooded all the time, right? And so they'd rent out. Uh, a space, you rent out the land and you can build your little house shack. Sometimes in the case of the people who built their shacks on Bohemian Flats in Minneapolis, old uh, pieces of lumber would come down from the falls and the mills and they'd go out and gather it and bring it in and help use it to build their houses. This one on the, uh, on the left is actually during a flood uh, and the lower levee in, in St. Paul also flooded. Both of these communities were basically eliminated by uh, because they, because of the flooding issue, uh, the, the Bohemian Flats was gone by the 30s, more or less. The Upper Levee Flats survived until the 1950s, uh, before the city finally got tired of going in there every three years and having to deal with the floods and just tore out the whole thing. And as part of their incredibly wise riverfront strategy at that time, they placed a junkyard there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they they got rid of that later, fortunately. So, um, but. Um, Here's my, my little list of what the 1880s brought in the Twin Cities, and it's pretty much everything that we think of as a modern city it was essentially developed and built here in the 1880s. My guess, and it's really a guess based on reports, at least 50,000 buildings were built in the Twin Cities in the 1880s. That's, I mean, now if you get, what, uh, 300 building permits a year in Minneapolis or St. Paul, that's a huge number. First high-rise metal frame office buildings, You'll see later at least 40 were built, uh, high-rise office buildings. What, when high-rise in those days was six to 12 stories. Um, and, almost, and the vast majority of them were built within a five-year span between 1885 and 1890. It's just like this whole thing exploded. Mills capable of producing a million pounds of flour a day, large industrial structures, grand hotels, the first grand hotels, first department stores, first gourmet restaurants, first modern style apartment buildings. Lavish mansions as large as 25,000 square feet, and in the case of the Hill Mansion of 1891, a little bit more. Art museums, central libraries, huge new public buildings, park systems, first asphalt paved streets, concrete sidewalks, electric streetcars were introduced, electric lighting, hydropower, telephone, central heating, modern sewer systems, and uh, a rapidly growing rail neck, the first Union Depot, and of course the Stone Arch Bridge. Everything we think of really as the modern city essentially was first appeared in any scale here uh, in the 1880s. Uh, here's a downtown view of Minneapolis from the 1890s, and you see that by now we're already starting to see much taller buildings. That one in the center on the left is the old New York Life Insurance Building at 5th and 2nd, 5th Street and 2nd Avenue South. It's now gone, like most of the buildings that were from that period. And on the right is a view looking down Nicollet Avenue, uh, the, now the Nicollet Mall, um, from 6th Street, looking uh, north toward the river, and that's the syndicate block there on the, on the right. Um, we, what, we, what we had before were these kind of small, pretty provincial small cities, and by 1890, these were becoming major American cities. It happened that fast. Um, here's downtown St. Paul in the 1890s, same thing, uh, 4th Street and 6th Street. Notice again how narrow the streets look. Uh, this kind of reminds you of that sort of lower New York feel with Boston with the narrow streets and um, 
St. Paul just because I think the downtown area was so constricted. They just deliberately made the streets very, very narrow. But you can see on the left there, a first 12-story building um, in the Twin Cities, uh, the Pioneer Building in St. Paul, which was built from my old newspaper I worked for for many years, the St. Paul Pioneer Press. Mm -hmm. uh, that building still stands, and we'll take a look at that later. Um, but again, the scale has just ramped up very quickly. Um, these look like cities now, not like these little um, small, smallish towns or smaller cities that we saw before. And so, remember our first Minneapolis City Hall, what a fine little building that was? Well, here's the, here's the new one they started in 1889. Enormous building, built of, of massive blocks of granite quarries in western Minnesota. That tower was the highest um, object in the city uh, until, for many years, it was over 300 feet. There actually used to be a little lookout nests at the very top of that tower. I've always wanted to go up there and find it. Uh, but people, uh, they closed it down because people were throwing stuff off it. Can you imagine that? They were probably all baseball players, would be my <laughs> guess. <laughs> From what I've heard. I'm just guessing here. I don't know. Uh, um, but also notice uh, what was weird about the cities in the 1880s is that they were growing enormously fast, and yet the little parts of the old city, especially the downtown, were still there. Here's this enormous, gigantic city hall building. And look at the little, on the left there, look at the tiny little houses next to it. And you still had those kind of juxtaposition uh, uh, going on. And um, uh, that, was, that was pretty pretty typical of the period. But this is still one of the great um, city hall buildings in the United States. And uh, it's considered a classic example of the style. It's called Richardsonian Romanesque, for those of you who are architecture fans. And I see a lot of them out here. Maybe not. <laughs> Uh, named after H.H. H. Richardson, the great Boston architect who did Trinity Church, among other things, in Boston. In any event, um, first public library in Minneapolis, first big public library down up here on Hennepin, 10th and Hennepin. And it's a measure of my age that I remember this building, going into it as a kid. Um, that was, I think, in the previous century. That's how old I am. Um, think about it for a minute. Um, anyway, the first, um, the first public library building, and this building we're here today is actually the third major downtown library. There was another building here built in the early 1960s that, that was raised to make way for this uh, very lovely Caesar Pelly building. Um, we also had the great industrial exposition building built in Minneapolis. And this, I, I love the story of this building because it, you look at this big, gigantic building, which became the scene of the 1892 Republican National Convention nominated Benjamin Harrison, and in classic Minnesota fashion, Harrison lost the big game. Uh, <laughs> sorry to tell you, but it's the old Minnesota story. But anyway, um, they built, the, this was designed to, sh to show off all of the city's industry, and it's one of those big Victorian things, and they had an annual event. People would come, and they'd say, oh, look at that giant generator, look at all those flour milling equipment, blah, blah, blah. They built this building in three months. Uh, and and it, it's kind of a, almost a modular building, the way they put it together. Um, and it stood for many years uh, and eventually became home to a stock food company owned by um, Marion Savage, who was best known in the sporting world as the owner of Dan Patch, the world's fastest pacer at the turn of the 20th century. And he owned Dan Patch and used him as a grand advertising local. Uh, logo, and then this building was then torn down and became the site of a Coca-Cola bottling plant. And that's been torn down, and now there's uh, housing there. But um, uh, the, the energies of the Victorian age were just amazing, and to put up a building like this in three months, I can't imagine doing it today with all of our modern technology and equipment. Uh, St. Paul also built its uh, city hall and courthouse. Um, this was at uh, Fourth and Wabasha, and uh, your typical big stone Victorian pile. If you go out to a local cemetery here just over by Fort Snelling called Acacia Park, you'll find stone from this building you reused for um, some of the cemetery buildings. By the way, that structure there, that, or that uh, little car going by there, that's a cable car. St. Paul had a cable car system uh, in the late 1880s. Minneapolis did not, uh, but St. Paul did two cable cars, uh, two cable car routes. You know we had the largest cable car system in the country by far? Chicago, believe it or not, uh, not San Francisco. Uh, but the, the cable cars were quickly, uh, when, when the electric streetcar came in in the late, and, they, and they, they first appeared in the Twin Cities very late in 1889, they were such a vastly superior technology to cable cars, to any other uh, public transportation technology that anybody ever thought of before that they immediately just took over 
and Minneapolis and St. Paul had, an, had a very well developed uh, electric streetcar system uh, within a matter of five years. Uh, it spread that quickly. Of course, now it's all got ruined in the 50s, but that's another story. Um, St. Paul, the second St. Paul city, or ca state capital, was built uh, in 1883. Not a particularly impressive building. In fact, I ran across a newspaper uh, editorial referred to it as a rotten, miserable, and useless pile. <laughs> God, I'd love to write architecture criticism like that. Uh, but uh, uh, apparently there were problems with the ventilating system and uh, blah, 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 blah. And eventually it was replaced by that much bigger, fancier state capital designed by Cass Gilbert of ballpark fame, West Side ballpark fame, uh, which of course still stands in, uh, <laughs> in St. Paul. Um, anyway, um, I just thought I'd show you this because we're going to have a quiz later and anybody can identify all these buildings. <laughs> Going to win a big award, like a, a, one of my one of my books signed free. But anyway, uh, in the 1880s, I mean, I, I think I'm the only person who would ever put a list like this together because I'm the only person who would ever bother to even do it. But um, 23 buildings built in Minneapolis of six stories to six 12 stories in that 1880-1890 span. You see those two little ones with a little thing around them? Those are the two that still stand. <laughs> All the rest of them are gone, uh, including the late great metropolitan building. Um, but this was a new technology, radically new technology, using metal framing uh, to increase the height of buildings, and it happened very fast. Uh, and by the end of the decade, we had 12-story buildings uh, in Minneapolis, which were pretty close to the tallest buildings in the country, although Chicago by then had uh, some taller ones, as did New York. And um, uh, so that happened very rapidly, this explosion of new tall buildings, office buildings primarily. And same thing in St. Paul, not quite as many. But you'll notice that St. Paul, dear old St. Paul, still has five of its uh, 1880s um, skyscrapers, as they called them at the time, that uh, still stand. By the way, that one on the lower left, Stu had mentioned the St. Paul Daily Globe in the story there. That was the St. Paul Daily Globe's building um, in St. Paul. They are, of course, a long gone newspaper, owned for a time by James J. Hill. All right, uh, Syndicate Block. Uh, this was like the first huge, almost department store style building. It wasn't a department store, although there were big stores in it. Built in Minneapolis on Nicollet between 5th and 6th. And it gives you an idea of the increase in scale. Those of you who are old time Minneapolitans will know or probably remember that this eventually got, <laughs> got a, an awful uh, metal skin put on it and turned into the downtown J.C. Penney store. Where when I was a kid, we did the Dayton's Donaldson's Penny's Powers Circuit. You went to Dayton's to get the expensive stuff. You went to Donaldson's, I can't remember what. We always went to Penny's to get shoes for some reason. And I went to Powers to get books because they had a good book department. Those are the four big department stores. Um, they all have one thing in common now, which is that they're gone. But uh, <laughs> life moves on. Anyway, um, the, um, uh, looking at some of the other, uh, the big buildings that developed, this is the Lumber Exchange Building, which is just up here about a block at Fifth um, and um, uh, Hennepin. And I was surprised to read recently, and you see the early, the early version of it, then there was a fire and they expanded it a couple of times and they also increased the height, took off those little towers and stuff. Uh, this is believed to be the oldest 10-story um, or higher <coughs> office building left in the United States outside of New York City. I'm not, I, I read the statistic twice, I'm not quite sure I believe it, but it could well be true. Um, Chicago tore down just tons and tons and tons of stuff. I know that New York definitely has some taller buildings that period, but it, so it's a very old, long surviving, uh, very rare for a, a, a tall office building to survive as long as this one has. And the other one that survived, uh, the big one, uh, in downtown St. Paul is the Pioneer Building. Um, built in 1889. When this was built, it was the tallest building in the Twin Cities at 12 stories. Later got expanded to 16. It's now apartments, um, which has happened to a lot of the tall, old tall office buildings here and elsewhere. What makes the, uh, the, the Pioneer Building so unusual is that it still has its original 16-story high light court or atrium. And there are very, very, very few of these historic atriums left in the United States. I don't know, in fact, of another interior atrium quite like this of this scale anywhere left in the United States. It's a very rare survivor. And they've now turned it into apartments. 
It was basically a donut-shaped building, and, the, and they built these atriums and tall office buildings at that time because light was a big, big, huge issue, and they didn't have reliable electric lighting. And one way to get lighting into a big, squarish building was to put a hole right down the middle, put a skylight on top, and drive the light into the center of the building, which is what they did. Um, Donaldson's department store. This was the first major department store in the Twin Cities. Notice that dome on the corner, kind of modeled on the Parisian department stores, and Paris is kind of often thought of as where the department store concept first developed. Uh, this was called Donaldson's Glass Block, a very glassy building for the time. Um, and this was like typical of department stores in every major American city. They usually had a, a local family, in this case the Donaldson's Lawrence and his brother, whose name I'm forgetting at the moment. Um, started the store and then expanded over the years, eventually took up half a block, different buildings, different sections, and that was typical of the old department stores. This building, by the way, uh, in its final manifest, I'll show you the, here, this is what it looked like after it got refaced uh, in the late 1940s. This, of course, building, for those of us who are longtime Twin Cities, the last great downtown fire in the Twin Cities. Thanksgiving Day, 1982, destroyed this building and the adjoining 14-story enormous mammoth uh, North, Northwestern National Bank building. Uh, and it was started by a couple of kids, also baseball players. <laughs> just know it. All right, all right. I just know it. Um, and, um, uh, and now there's a uh, Northwest Center, uh, which is designed by the same architect who did this library, Cesar Pelli, who just died this year, by the way. A lovely man. I met him a couple of times. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, Wells Fargo. No, uh, yeah. Wells Fargo, now they call it. Wells Fargo Place or Wells Fargo Tower. But, um, he designed that, and that was what replaced this. All right. Um, over in St. Paul, you had also big department stores being developed. This is just one of them, the old Schooneman's department store at 6th and Wabashaw. And when Dayton's built a new apartment store across the street in 1964, they immediately tore this building down as fast as they could get their little hands on it, and it's still a parking lot. Uh, however, the Dayton's building is now, as some of you may know, a home for the practice rink of the Minnesota Wild. Uh, not exactly sure how that happened, but um, there it is. It's now called Treasure Island Center, I believe. And the Minnesota Wild skate there. Uh, in what used to be the, uh, I think, the milliner's department. I'm not sure. Um, um, we also saw the first great hotels, grand hotels. Before the 1880s, you didn't really have grand hotels. You just had these kind of old brick buildings, and they'd stuff a lot of people in them. And they weren't very attractive. This was the, uh, the late Great West Hotel, which was exactly one block from here at 5th and Hennepin. Um, and, by the way, still a parking lot. Uh, was raised in 1940, but just a, a, a grand, uh, great Victorian pile of a hotel, over 300 rooms, uh, many v quite fancy, uh, very lavish uh, appointed interiors, had a huge central lobby, skylit, because it was another one of those uh, donut buildings with a big hole in the middle. Um, and that became the first really great hotel in the Twin Cities. Um, and since that time, you could argue we don't actually build hotels quite as great anymore. Um, St. Paul also had its great hotel, the Ryan, at 6th and Robert, and you can see on this view on the right another donut hole building, big uh, central light court, and this was a, the great Victorian Gothic pile ever built in the Twin Cities, and well, unfortunately it was torn down in 1962, uh, great loss to St. Paul, it was a wonderful building, uh, and, and would still be, a, would be very expensive, I have no doubt, apartments today if it had been restored as it should have been. But it wasn't. And uh, it also had the grand lobby. Uh, one of the great stories about the lobby is supposedly there was a front desk there where, um, who was the great boxer? Sullivan. John, John L. Sullivan got so mad at the desk clerk one day, he pounded his fist and left a dent. You can believe that if you want. I don't know. I, I got no problem with it, but. Yes, <laughs> but uh, anyway, tales like that, grand old hotel that unfortunately is uh, long gone. Um, this was the great age of the railroads uh, in the Twin Cities and elsewhere. Um, Chicago was, of course, because of its location at the tip of Great Lake Michigan, everything had to go through Chicago. And, uh, but if you came out of Chicago and were going anywhere at the Pacific Northwest, uh, that whole area there, you came through St. Paul. And Minneapolis, but St. Paul was actually the bigger of, of the two uh, 
depots at one time and, and more rail traffic. On uh, the Great Northern, the Northern Pacific were based in St. Paul, as were a couple other railroads. Uh, Sioux Line was based in Minneapolis, which William Washburn built. Um, great railroad centers. This was the first Minneapolis Union Depot, uh, right at the foot of Hennepin Avenue, again, about two blocks from here. And that was later replaced um, by the uh, Great Northern Depot, built in 1914, and that has also been destroyed now, so it doesn't exist. The Federal Reserve Bank is essentially on the site of the Great Northern uh, Depot. This was right across the street from where that was. And you can see the second Hennepin Avenue suspension bridge. By the way, that crossing there was the first, the first crossing uh, by bridge of the Mississippi River in the United States was at that site. The first bridge was 1855. Uh, and, the, and the second crossing, or the third crossing, was in St. Paul in 1859. So. And of course, the river here, it helped that the river here wasn't very wide, and you had a nice island in the middle of it, so you didn't have to, you didn't have to have, make a long span uh, by, uh, by today's standards. Uh, the Great Bridge in the Twin Cities, I think most people would agree. The Great Stone Arch Bridge, built in 1883, and that was built by James J. Hill, his railroad, to get his trains into this depot. And that's why it has that curve, because they had to come in and parallel the river and come north to get into that depot. And uh, just a beautiful piece of masonry engineering, the kind of bridge nobody builds anymore. It's the only stone arch bridge on the Mississippi, left on the Mississippi, and um, absolutely the best walk in Minneapolis to walk across that bridge. And you see the whole St. Anthony Falls and the whole milling complex, and it just opens up the whole city to you. And it's not that cold out there today, but it's kind of windy. So if you really get over there, take a look. Um, St. Paul also had its uh, big Union Depot built in 1881. It burned down or was burned and then rebuilt in 1884. Um, now St. Paul has, still has its newer Union Depot built in the 20s. Um, but this was the first big depot. Notice that on the lower right there, the, just the huge amount of train traffic that came in and around this depot. There were huge yards by it. Um, great iron train shed behind it that was built in the 1890s. Um, and, and I think I read there's some amazing statistics on the percentage of people in St. Paul uh, in the late 19th century who were employed by the railroads. And I can't remember them offhand, but it was very large. Northern Pacific had big shops here. The Great Northern had big shops. The Chicago and Omaha had shops. Uh, they were just, uh, it was just the big industry in St. Paul. Um, okay, Pillsbury A. Mill, now apartments. The fate of all old mill buildings is to become apartments or something. Um, this was built in 1881, and when this was built, uh, it, it replaced the Washburn Mill across the river as the largest flour mill in the world. Uh, and it was a double mill. There were two, essentially, two identical mills uh, inside driven by um, two giant uh, turbines, two pits. And this, I love this picture because it shows you what St. Anthony Falls sort of was like in its natural state. Uh, there was a waterfall here. There was a 16-foot drop over a, a, a ledge and then big rapids above and below and to count for the whole fall. But it was really quite a big drop, and that big drop of water allowed them to produce a tremendous amount of power, and that's what fueled the milling industry. And to give you a sense of just the scale of this thing, this is the tail race or the head race tunnel underneath that mill, which is still there. It runs for over 600 feet, I think. It's an enormous piece of engineering. And, and picture this as just filled with water racing from the top of the river, plunging into these deep pits where there's these giant turbines at the bottom, each one powering that entire mill complex by, by, just by the force of falling water. It's, uh, <coughs> eventually, the Historical Society hopes to have this uh, complex, including the tunnels, open for tours. I think it would be a great place for a little boat ride. You know? <laughs> <coughs> I don't know. Um, the rich go richer. <clears throat> Hold on, I'm just going to get a little drink here. Yeah, I, I got a, I got a ham beer. I, I'll have a ham. <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe the grain belt. That would be good. Yeah, I like the grain belt. <laughs> they still get the grain belt, but it's not brewed here anymore. Um, anyway, the rich get richer. The, the scale of the mansions in the 1880s just grew enormously. The people who had been living in those three or 4,000 square foot mansions. Now they had the money to build five, six, eight, ten, twenty thousand square foot mansions. And they appeared all around uh, downtown Minneapolis in places like Park Avenue and Laurie Hill and um, Loring Park and, and all over um, in all the big fancy Victorian styles. The biggest of all was this one, the William Washburn Mansion called Fair Oaks. If you've been to the Minneapolis Institute of Arts, been to Fair Oaks Park, which is right in front of the Institute of Arts. 
uh, that was his yard. That park was his 10-acre yard in Minneapolis. And he built this house, which I guess, I guesstimate was at least 25,000 square feet, maybe more. Uh, enormous towering stone mansion. Of course, it had its own ballroom, its own elevator, uh, its own everything. And uh, Washburn eventually gave it to the city of Minneapolis after his death um, and, and turned the land over for park. And the city said, thank you very much. What the hell do we do with this thing? <laughs> uh, uh, it was like, you know, the classic giant mansion maintenance nightmare. And so um, they tried to use it for a while, and they finally got tired of it and tore it down in 1924. So it only stood for 40 years, which is actually not all that uncommon for these big mansions. A lot of them don't have very long lives. St. Paul, same deal, lots of mansions all over the place, mostly up on the hills overlooking downtown. Downtown Minneapolis is mostly level. You got a little bit of elevation with Lowry Hill off to one side. St. Paul sits in a bowl, and there's bluffs all around, and um, if there's one lesson in life I've learned, it's that's the rich crave altitude. And, um, <laughs> and which is why I live down on the West 7th Street Flats area. So I don't, uh, I'm not quite up there. But I can look up, I can literally look up and see James J. Hill House from my back. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can aspire. Um, anyway, um, so these big houses were built um, on Summit Avenue, up by the, where the state capitol is now. Uh, they're all gone, uh, at least all the ones I'm showing you here. A lot of mansions still exist on Summit, but uh, mm -hmm. most of the other mansion districts in St. Paul are now uh, ancient history, but again, very, very large, elaborate, costly houses. And uh, the most famous lost mansion in St. Paul on Summit Avenue is this one. This was the Amherst Wilder House, which was right next door to the James J. Hill Mansion, um, right at the top of what they call the Selby Avenue Hill, and that's a, that's a cable car. Uh, going up that hill, uh, that picture on the lower right, uh, that's the Wilder Mansion with all of its towers and goodies uh, displaying itself. Um, this building was eventually taken over by, uh, was donated to the Catholic Church. Uh, they used it as their archdiocesan uh, residence until they got tired of it and tore it down in 1959. Um, but um, typical of the, uh, of kind of the enormous houses that uh, people could build. And of course, Amherst Wilder founded the Wilder Foundation, which is still very active in all sorts of charitable endeavors um, in St. Paul and elsewhere. Um, but if you go to St. Paul, you can still find a lot of stuff from the 1880s. This is just a sampling of mansions from the 1880s on Summit Avenue in St. Paul, including the row house there on the right, uh, which is where the 22-year-old F. Scott Fitzgerald completed his first novel, The Side of Paradise. And supposedly it ran out in the streets when Scriveners announced they would publish it and t t told everybody, I did the same thing, but no one paid any attention. <laughs> uh, I ran out of the bathroom and said, I've written a novel. <laughs> you know, we don't want to hear about it. So, um, but anyway, um, uh, there's a lot of Fitzgerald lore, uh, some of which is true, um, about his days in St. Paul. And um, my, my sad fact about Fitzgerald is supposedly before he died, he was going to come back to St. Paul in his old age and write, a novel about James J. Hill. Can you imagine what a good book that would have been? <laughs> oh my! But uh, you know, he only lived to be 44, and he just didn't get to it, which is uh, too bad. Um, so finally, I want to show you just a, a few uh, quick uh, visions of uh, my latest, my latest and last architectural book, which is a history of the great. Metropolitan Building in Minneapolis, uh, which appeared in 1890 and was, to me, the summation of the 1880s in the Twin Cities, uh, how they had come of age. This was about a $2 million building, which was an enormous sum for uh, an office building or any building at that time. Uh, it was the tallest building in the city, the grandest building in the city. Um, still, I think, a, on a national scale, a Victorian masterpiece, um, one of the great office buildings of its time in the United States. Um, famous, um, here's a picture on the uh, left that shows it shortly after it was built. It was at 2nd Avenue South and 3rd Street uh, in Minneapolis, which would put it about uh, six, seven blocks from here, not very far. Uh, famous for its uh, interior light court, which ran all the way to the top of the building, glass, iron, we'll see a little bit more of that later. Um, very lavish building, had a rooftop garden, had a restaurant. The entire 12th floor was a gigantic restaurant, which they very romantically named the Guarantee Loan Restaurant. Which I thought, 
And that's probably why it didn't last all that long. It wasn't a real grabber of a name. You know, I was like, oh, let's go to the Guaranteed Loan Restaurant. But they had, um, not only did they have the restaurant, they had a woman's room, a men's room, a, a billiard room, uh, God knows what else, and a rooftop garden where in summer you could go and listen to bands. And it was, I believe this was the only the second rooftop garden atop a um, uh, commercial building in the United States at the time. There was one in New York, supposedly. Again, though, who keeps these stats, right? It's like, I don't know. I remember once I read a story about it. Somebody said there was a swimming pool in St. Paul built on the eighth floor of the... Um, St. Paul Athletic Club in, I think, 1917, and they had a little thing saying, this is the highest swimming pool in America. I'm like, how do you know that? <laughs> Have you been to every swimming pool? I mean, and, and moreover, why would you care? But anyway, um, uh, uh, just a fabulous building, uh, faced all in stone, um, and it was just the culmination of all the energies that had poured through the Twin Cities in the 1880s to turn these um, pretty modest cities into a, a, a genuine metropolis. And uh, there we go. Uh, at the center of it was this incredible light court, um, ran up the whole height of the building from the second floor. Notice it had glass floors uh, all around. Those, those are glass floors, actually one inch sheets of glass that you walked on. It scared the hell out of people. Um, <laughs> and it was an aesthetic thing, but it was also very much part of the whole plan of the building, which was to get every bit of light you could through that center skylight down into the offices, because if you didn't have that light, you couldn't rent the offices. And so uh, the floor down below there that you see on the bottom with the staircase, that was glass block. The whole floors on the first and second floor were glass block, again, designed to bring light all the way through the heart of the building. Um, here's some views of the interior uh, at, at lower levels. Six open cage elevators, which were hydraulic. They ran by little pistons in the basement. and. Um, when the building was torn down in 1961, those original elevators were all still operating perfectly. They had never been electrified. They were still basically a, a piston-operated, hydraulic-operated elevator. And apparently when you got into them and they run, had, you had somebody run, they would kind of bounce, <laughs> which must have been sort of interesting. Uh, I was actually in this building about a year before they tore it down. My dad, who worked two blocks away, said, you just drag me down. I mean, you've got you to take a look at this. And um, I did a, a, a presentation on my book here about a year ago, and I, I showed a picture of a, of a young kid standing, looking over from the top floor down to the bottom. And after the presentation, a guy comes up to me and says, that's me in that picture. <laughs> and I'm like, wow. Uh, that happens sometimes when you, uh, I've had it happen to me a number of times that people have kind of come out of the blue and said, you know, I, I, I knew that or I know so-and-so. So anyway, a wonderful building. Uh, urban renewal struck hard here in the 1960s. They had the famous Gateway Urban Renewal Project from the 1950s to 1960s. They had the old Washington Avenue, Hennepin Avenue, the old Tenderloin District. They just tore it all down, put up mostly bad new buildings. And among the buildings they decided they had to tear down was this one, the Metropolitan, and so they did. And um, it came down in 1962. Uh, fortunately, all of the ironwork inside was sold off. I actually have three pieces of it in my study. It inspires me for some, some reason. Um, and, um, and some of the stonework was saved as well, and you can now find it in various locations around Minneapolis. But the building is unfortunately long gone. And I'm going to leave you on a happy note because you say to yourself, you tear down a magnificent piece of architecture, one of the great buildings of its time in the country, certainly the great commercial building in the Twin Cities. You want to make sure if you're going to do that, you replace it with something really beautiful, right? So there it is. <laughs> All right. <laughs> in any event, uh, that, that's my show, and I'm sticking to it. And if we want to answer any questions, uh, I'd be happy to. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. A, a comment and a question. You said you uh, didn't know why you stopped at Donaldson's on the way to Pennies and Powers. I yeah. suspect you stopped at the lunch counter because they had a great uh, lunch there at Donaldson's. Oh, yeah, it could very well be. Yeah, yes. it could very well be, yeah. And then uh, the second uh, item was I worked in the Northwestern National Bank building before it burned. I was in that building, but of course wasn't there on Thanksgiving Day, 1982. But for years afterwards, there were rumors that the two delinquents that you mentioned uh, really didn't burn the building down by, 
by uh, horsing around on Thanksgiving Day, but rather it was a conspiracy by the bank that wanted to take the building down, but it yeah, wouldn't have been permitted to come down. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, uh, <laughs> we live in the age of conspiracy theories. I, I think it's a little far-fetched, but um, I'm sure I would not surprise at all that such a such a theory would be out there. We have a few more here. It looks like. Uh, for someone who's not from Minneapolis, and feel free to say you have to buy the book to get the answer to this, what was going on with the Metropolitan right before it was torn down? Had it been abandoned? Was it? It had been purchased by the city's Housing and Redevelopment Authority uh, with the sole intent of tearing it down. And there had been a big dispute over the price. The owner wanted to save it. It was still a going bu building, still in solid condition, but the city did not like the look of it in its brand new shiny district. So they bought the building by uh, basically by um, by force. They, they took it. Uh, there's a word for it. Uh, domain. Yeah, well, not eminent domain, but there's even a faster version of it. Um, but yeah, essentially eminent domain. They took it uh, while they were still debating uh, the price. They emptied it out. It was a pretty well occupied building. Completely emptied it out. In fact, guess who had their offices there? The HRA. <laughs> <laughs> they emptied it out, and then it stood vacant for about six months. And every photographer in Minnesota came to take a picture of it. Everybody loved the building. My dad took me there. Everybody came into the building to see it. It was like, you know, it was like seeing the old, old relative who was about to die. And everybody comes in and says, well, there's Uncle Freddy. He's about to go, but we all loved Uncle Freddy. And, um, and we all went to see it, and we're all kind of sad. And then they just, they tore it down, and there were all sorts, there was a huge fight over it. They tried um, uh, arch local architects. Philip Johnson, who did the IDS building in Minneapolis, this is back in 19... 58 wrote a letter saying you ought not tear this thing down. Ralph Rapson, who ran the School of Architects University, was a great model. Well, you ought not tear this thing down. Everybody said, don't tear this thing down. But the city spent a million dollars, essentially, to tear down a building that they valued at $200,000. And they ultimately paid the owner, I think, 300 and some thousand for. But in legal fees and all the costs, the, it was an extremely expensive building to tear down. It took them a long time. It doesn't make any sense. but. We all know that sometimes life doesn't make any sense, and this was one of those cases. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Hi, hi. As, as, as far as you know, uh, in the 1880s, was there ever a baseball thrown from the top of the Guarantee Your Own building? <laughs> <laughs> Probably a reprobate? <laughs> I hope so. Yeah, he was, uh, we, Stu, Stu is denying it. Um, I don't know. I do remember people, when I was a kid, we used to go to the top of the Fauché Tower and people would throw paper airplanes down. Um, I don't know, but that would be worthy probably of a book if I could figure it out. Uh, the boy who threw a baseball, you would have killed somebody if it hit him on the head probably. It, it was a, the, the upper lookout tower was 222 feet above the street, so it's, that would have some Newtonian velocity by the time it got to the monitor. <laughs> don't ask me to calculate it, however. I never did figure that out. Any other questions? Yes. Um, the rivalry between Minneapolis and St. Paul is legendary. Yes. Uh, does that stem from this era? And another question related to that is I understand that there was a great census war between the two cities. So yes. I'm wondering if you can comment on that and give some background on that. Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of rivalry. Um, um, St. Paul is the older of the two cities, started out as the larger of the two. Minneapolis caught up by 1880 was the first year that Minneapolis was larger than St. Paul. Um, by a little bit. And so they had, in 1890, there was this big, big census war between the two cities, both vying to see which city, you know, would, would win the census count. And there are all sorts of stories. There, there's, uh, there have been articles done about it. Um, there are these legendary stories, again, uh, about, for example, the, the census takers eventually discovered that there were like 20 people living in a barber shop in St. Paul, you know. <laughs> Apparently they needed daily tending to their hair. And so there was all this skullduggery and, and uh, God, I remember one headline in the Minneapolis papers, and it said, uh, how'd it go, the mask of hypocrisy ripped from the evil face of St. Paul, or something <laughs> like that, you know? <laughs> it's like, oh my God. Um, so it was, it was, you know, I think a lot of it was a newspaper war. The newspapers liked to go at it, it was fun. Uh, and, but yeah, there was definitely some skullduggery on both sides, but when the, when the official count came in, uh, Minneapolis was clearly ahead of the game, uh, uh, St. Paul, and it's continued so now. Uh, although the cities are only about 100,000 apart now. Minneapolis is about 420, I think, is the latest. St. Paul, 310 to 320. Uh, at one time, Minneapolis was well over 500. 
and that was its biggest um, level. And St. Paul's big, St. Paul actually now is the largest it's ever been, population-wise. Minneapolis still has about 100,000 to go to. And, they're, and they'll, they're gonna have to get with all the apartments and everything else, and Minneapolis will keep on going up for a while, I think. But yeah, it was over 500,000 at one time. Uh, one more question, yes, sir. Um, can you predict the final year of Wrigley Field in Chicago? <laughs> <laughs> oh, sure. Let's go for, uh, I don't know, um, I'm going to say, let's see, what are we, 19, I'm going to go for 20, 28. All right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hopefully I'll still be alive to see that. Well, thank you all very much. All right. So um, unfortunately, as we mentioned earlier today, Brian Madigan is unable to join us, but uh, we're lucky to have a fellow Halsey Hall Sabre member in his stead. So I would like to introduce Bob Tholkus. He is um, from Minneapolis. He's a veteran contributor to Sabre publications, co concentrating in recent years on baseball's amateur era from 1845 to 1865. His past activities include several terms as an officer of the Halsey Hall chapter, biographical research on major leaguers with Minnesota connections, and serving as newsletter editor of Sabres Origins of Baseball Committee. He also operated the Quick Steps Baseball Club in the Twin Cities for more than 20 years. So with his presentation, hurrah for Cecil O. Monroe, Minnesota's baseball infancy. Please welcome Bob Thilkis. Yours right there, isn't it? Oh, can you open it? Yeah, see. See. <coughs> and slide share. Okay. And then from beginning. Yeah. Okay. That's it. Yeah. It's okay. up there again. Cool. Thank you. Right. <coughs> if uh, at this uh, symposium on uh, 19th century baseball in Minnesota, uh, you've been wondering why we haven't told you how it got started. Uh, it's because I wasn't speaking until now. Um, and uh, the title uh, reflects a, a, long, a, a piece of gratitude I long have felt, which I'll tell you about. Uh, for decades now, I've been interested in Civil War era baseball, including in uh, my home state, uh, Minnesota. At the start of this endeavor, uh, chronicling those beginnings in the pre-internet years of scrolling through microfilm seemed a, a long-term, time-consuming prospect. Early on, however, I explored the index of the Minnesota History Quarterly, published by the Minnesota Historical Society, and found Cecil O. Monroe. Monroe was the author of The Rise of Baseball in Minnesota, an article published in the Quarterly in 1938. What a relief. Monroe had already done the research, uh, <laughs> with uh, footnotes even, so that his sources could be revisited. So who was Cecil O. Monroe? There he is. Monroe was born in 1900 in rural Falk County, South Dakota graduated from Dakota Wesleyan University in uh, Mitchell, South Dakota, and at the, at the time the largest independent college in the state, and spent his working life as a high school teacher in Aberdeen, South Dakota, teaching social studies. He died in Yankton, guess where? 
in uh, 1965. His obituaries, unsurprisingly, uh, do not mention how he came to write The Rise of Baseball in Minnesota in 1938. Presumably, he had some interest in baseball, and he taught high school history. An Aberdeen High School a yearbook, uh, from which this picture is taken, mentions that he also trained at the University of Minnesota, uh, but not when. It's a supposition, uh, therefore, uh, but uh, since he likely needed to be in the, uh, at the University of Minnesota, or at least in the Twin Cities, to uh, use the sources uh, he quoted in, uh, in his RISE article, available at the Historical Society's newspaper library. Um, so his, his baseball research presumably is connected with his graduate uh, work at the University of Minnesota. There may even be a connection with the then active uh, Works Progress Administration uh, Writers Project, which uh, subsidized writing on baseball history, among other subjects. The first uh, published reference to uh, local baseball that Monroe found dates from August 1857, uh, the year before the Minnesota became a state, when the organization of a club was announced in Nininger. Nininger had been incorporated in the winter of 1856-57 in Dakota County on the Mississippi southeast of St. Paul. It reached a acclaimed population of 1,000 in 1858, but uh, faded thereafter, helped along by the Panic of 1857, and was a memory by the turn of the century. A Wikipedia article uh, lists it as one of two uh, ghost towns in Minnesota although no structures survive. The name persists as Nininger, Nininger Township, uh, just west of the present town of Hastings. But did the uh, club formed in Nininger uh, play what became the national rules, uh, then only recognized by clubs in greater New York City? Bat and ball games under various names, including baseball, were a national pastime from colonial days. Uh, Monroe uh, didn't mention uh, this citation, but the club's organization was reported in correspondence from its president, uh, George H. Burns, a, a private banker, to the New York City-based uh, sporting weekly, Porter's Spirit of the Times, in its issue of August 29, 1857, which stated that the, at the club's organizational meeting on August 8th, The, uh, the, that the uh, club had specifically adopted the uh, uh, rules of the uh, baseball convention held in New York City early in 1857. Porters, uh, which is the only one of the three uh, New York weeklies covering New York ruled baseball to be part of the Historical Society's holdings, had published the new rules both in 1856 and 1857 and so was the most likely source for the Nininger group. Chronologically, its August 8th the formation uh, date uh, makes Nininger the second location outside of greater New York City to adopt the New York rules after the Tri-Mountain Club of Boston in June and uh, narrowly uh, prior to clubs in Detroit and Buffalo. Monroe uh, next quotes a, a newspaper reference, ev reference, of which there are several, to regular play in 1859 in St. Paul among members of the Olympic Club, which had formed the previous winter for the purpose of exercise. The club didn't feel the need uh, in 1860, however, until August, or perhaps had uh, lost its 18 1859 playing location west of downtown on the road to the U.S. Army outpost at Fort Snelling, since it played in 1860 in an open area east of town, sharing space with the St. Paul Cricket Club. Monroe passes over the uh, Civil War years, April 1861 to April 1865, uh, noting that, uh, quote, events of more significance absorb the energy and attention of citizens, and not necessarily merely the distant war between the states, since the Dakota War had erupted in-state in 1862 and persisted until 1863. 
A baseball club may have continued to operate in St. Paul during the war, at least in 1864, uh, when in March the St. Paul Baseball Club published an invitation to ball players in general to join them for exercise. Monroe uh, next references the first interclub match on May 18, 1865, between the North Star Club of St. Paul and the Excelsior of Fort Snelling, won by the North Stars, 38 to 14. The North Star, shortly after, announced its intention to obtain such necessary trappings as uniforms and a, a clubhouse. Next up was the uh, first intercity match of record between the North Star and the Vermilion Club of Hastings, two one-sided triumphs for the more experienced uh, St. Paul team. Baseball in St. Paul continued to move around. The St. Paul match uh, was played on, uh, quote, the common uh, below Broadway. Broadway is a north-south street uh, running on the east side of the present downtown to the Mississippi. Much of it vanished in the 1960s under Interstate 94 and its right-of-way, but a few blocks uh, still exist, uh, running north from Kellogg Boulevard. It's now back in baseball, as uh, locals may know, um, as the uh, front door of a CHS field, uh, home of the St. Paul Saints. Below Broadway presumably means that the ballpark was below the bluffs, close to the riverfront, an area now occupied by the uh, St. Paul Post Office building. Monroe mentions the newspaper reports in both towns, complaining that North Star pitcher and captain R.C. Olin had been allowed to break the pitching rules. The St. Paul Press uh, described his pitching as suitable for cricket. This likely means that he was employing a, a round arm, side arm style, uh, which usually, but not always, uh, was considered in baseball to be a throw, which was illegal, rather than the customary underhand delivery. As was also customary, both matches uh, were followed by banquets uh, thrown by the host club. Post-match banquets were the primary opportunities for the camaraderie between amateur clubs, which was an essential element of the game in the 1860s. Toasts were drunk, uh, speeches made, uh, songs sung, and the game ball, it was customary to uh, try to use only one for the whole game, uh, presented to the victorious club, another custom transported from New York City. An initially alarming uh, note in the St. Paul press that following the St. Paul match, the Vermilion Club went down on the riverboat Aurora, uh, apparently referred not to a shipboard tragedy, uh, but to traveling downriver to Hastings. Moving on to 1866, Monroe chronicled the formation of the uh, first clubs outside of what is now the Twin Cities metro area, the Champion in Winona and the Crescent in Red Wing, both Mississippi River towns the southeast of the metro. St. Paul baseball also continued to expand. Uh, the North Star Club apparently disbanded, but was replaced by two clubs. The Saxon, uh, described as representing the uh, city's lower town uh, neighborhoods near the river, and the Olympic, representing Upper Town on the River Bluffs. The Olympic uh, won three of four matches from their intercity arrivals. The clubs had second nines and a match between two junior clubs, which would be uh, players under uh, 18, the Liberty and the Independent, uh, was recorded. The North Star Club uh, revived and expanded for 1867, and Monroe credits it with spearhead spearheading baseballs redoubled expansion in the state. It reached out for matches with a new club in fast-growing Minneapolis, as well as to the Crescent in Red Wing and in a new direction, uh, Southwest, to play the new Frontier Club in Mankato. Outclassing the opposition in all of these uh, games, it was acknowledged as a champion club of the state. Monroe was impressed with the North Star's uh, degree of organization. It met regularly, had grown to 57 members, fielded three nines, and played frequent practices and social games. It was rewarded with a strong public interest. The club's grounds had moved again, further east uh, from downtown to the Dayton's Bluff neighborhood. The crowd traveling from all parts of the city to attend the second match with Minneapolis on June 14th 
was large enough so that every last uh, omnibus and livery, livery team available was pressed into service until finally the stables ran out of horses. Monroe reports that uh, baseball interest in many other towns, mostly in southern Minnesota, reached a point in 1867 where clubs could be organized. Uh, Owatonna, uh, Northfield, Faribault, Dundas, uh, Lake City, Stillwater, Rochester, St. Peter, and uh, perhaps because it was northernmost, a club in St. Paul called the Arctic. A Rochester uh, paper reported in July that the clubs were forming in, uh, quote, every village, town, and hamlet. With expansion, uh, Monroe notes, the clubs felt the need for an association, and for him, the formation of this association was, uh, quote, the outstanding feature of Minnesota baseball history in 1867. The impetus for immediate action was a notice printed in the St. Paul Press on August 20th over the names of nine club presidents calling a baseball players conference for September 4th in St. Paul for the purpose of establishing an association. The conference uh, met at scheduled. In, in an apparent uh, bid for prestige and public interest, it elected as president General Henry H. Uh, Sibley, uh, famed in the state as a soldier and civic leader. The general, in his acceptance speech, praised the game as promoting the health and good habits of the players, since it kept them from spending their free time at uh, less wholesome sources of amusement, and praised the value of the players as examples for young boys. The association otherwise uh, mimicked the features of similar associations around the country. Less successful was the association's endorsement of a state tournament held in St. Paul three weeks later. Only five clubs uh, showed up. Play was regardless divided into two classes. The North Star won the first class championship and the Saxon Club of St. Paul the second class championship. The North Star's prize was a seven pound silver ball, suitably emblazoned. As Monroe noted, the creation of a statewide association rule, uh, and rules did not smooth out, uh, quote, the uh, bumps in the path of championship play. With hindsight, the association's error may have been in seeking to regulate championship play at all, uh, something the parent the National Association of Baseball Players, based in New York City, never attempted in this era of individually arranged best two out of three uh, challenge matches. Crowning a champion was in any case not one of the association's stated goals. The North Star uh, rested on their laurels in 1868 finally bestirring itself to accept a challenge from the Minnehaha of Northfield, scheduled for July 17th in St. Paul. The Minnehaha had, ha -ha had already posted wins over Faribault and Hastings. Minnesota, the baseball's first notable experience of controversy, preceded this match. Under the new rules of the new state association, a player had to be a res resident in his club city for 30 days to be eligible to play. The North Stars uh, tried to use the uh, pitcher from the Stillwater Club, uh, William Miller, on the grounds that he intended to move to St. Paul <laughs> and uh, was rebuffed. Uh, then rain forced a halt after four innings with the mini ha ha leading 29 to 25. St. Paul tried to stop play at that point, but the mini ha ha insisted that play continue. Uh, the match was finally called after eight innings with the visitors ahead, 78 to 38. The North Stars, who apparently had played rather lackadaisically after the rain delay, uh, continued to protest that the match should not be declared official. Uh, but as Monroe notes, uh, they finally yielded rather than appear uh, ungentlemanly. On August the 14th in Northfield, the uh, Minnehaha settled the issue by defeating the North Star again, 40 to 38. In September, they were in turn challenged by the St. Croix of Stillwater, whose pitcher, uh, Mr. Miller, had apparently decided not to move to St. Paul after all. <laughs> he pitched the uh, Stillwater Club to a 36-23 victory on September 23rd at Northfield. Northfield had been under strength on the day, however, with its uh, captain absent and two others so ill, allegedly at least, that they were allowed courtesy runners. 
uh, the Minnehaha won the second match in Stillwater on October 9th. Uh, Miller was sick and, apparent, and uh, did not pitch by 58 to 47. The conquering match uh, took place on October 24th at Hastings. This resulted in a pitcher's duel, uh, which, as Monroe notes, was reckoned by the press to be the best game played in the state to date and was won, won by the red-shirted uh, St. Croix, 17 to 13. With it went the silver ball for 1868. The silver ball uh, bounced uh, from Stillwater to Lake City in, eight, in July 1869 when the Union Club defeated the 1868 champions in a series of matches. The Saxon Club of St. Paul then defeated uh, Lake City, turned back a challenge by the Crescent, and accepted a final challenge to play the Gopher State Club of Rochester during the State Fair held that year in Rochester. Contro controversy uh, broke out since again uh, during the first match uh, when the Saxon placed a second fielder in foul territory behind the catcher, the second pitcher re catcher recorded a put out. A protracted uh, wrangle resulted in the Saxon leaving the field and the umpire declared the Gopher State Club the winner. A second match had been scheduled for the following morning. It began as scheduled and the score was tied when the Saxon announced that they had to catch a train for St. Paul and decamped, a silver ball and all. The umpire again declared Rochester the winner, but the Saxon refused to uh, comply and held the silver ball, if not the championship, until defeated in July 1870. The last season the Monroe covered by the Union Club of Minneapolis. Monroe closed his articles with a, a few final points. He noted that margins of victory dropped over the period he covered, indicating that playing talent, talent had become spread more evenly and that runs scored declined, showing that the quality of play advanced. Baseball became a feature attraction during holiday festivals with uh, many games played on July 4th. Cash prizes, he noted, replaced uh, trophies at these events, um, although outright professionalism uh, wasn't not known. There were recommendations to clubs to engage a, a, play, a paid expert to improve their game. Uh, these show up in 1869. In some, um, Cecil Monroe did uh, invaluable, if uh, not comprehensive, work. He did not list the, uh, so all the sources he accessed uh, so there was still scope for determining what else was out there. He included no background on prominent players and did not speculate on the source for the area's adoption of the national rules, especially at such an early date. Uh, there is uh, still, even now, uh, much that we can learn. As uh, Brenda noted earlier in the day, the uh, spread of baseball project uh, uh, poster in the lobby indicates there are still 30 counties, much less towns, that we don't know the earliest uh, game uh, played for. So we hope that effort will continue. Any questions?